bring the Committee of the Whole to order. Um, as a student of Irish history, if not literature, I want to wish everyone a good Blooms Day. In light of the public health emergency, the governor has issued an emergency order suspending the section of the Open Public Meetings Act that requires we have a physical space for the public to watch our meetings. This order has been extended by leadership of the Senate, um, the State Senate and the State House of Representatives. As we start today, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands of the Puget Salish peoples, past and present. We thank these caretakers of the land who have lived here and continue to live here since time immemorial. Um, we'd also like to acknowledge the many urban Indians who live in King County and have brought their cultural ways of life here, greatly enriching um, the community. Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Bellucci? Here. Council Member Dombowski? Here. Council Member Dunn? Here. Council Member Colwells? Here. Council Member Lambert? Here. Council Member Updegrove? Here. Council Member Von Reichbauer? Council Member Von Reichbauer? Here. Council Member Zahalai? Here. Mr. Chair? Here. Mr. Chair, all- Mr. Von Reichbauer, I can see the concern in your eye. We have you as present. Um, today, we um, have a briefing from council staff on the COVID-19 supplemental appropriation request that was transmitted to the, to the council last week. We'll also take up the Harborview bond proposal. And after we hear from council staff, I anticipate going into executive session prior to taking action on the Harborview bond proposal. We also have on the agenda a briefing from members of the Charter Review Commission. The first related to subpoena power of the Office of the Law Enforcement, uh, Law Enforcement Oversight, and the second charter amendment related to the process of, for inquests. Depending on the conversation today, it is possible we would take action on each of those proposals today. Following the charter amendments, we'll take up a motion that asks the executive to provide flexibility to, to unincorporated area restaurants and retail businesses um, to operate outdoors. The last item on the agenda is a motion that asks the executive to provide for property tax payment plans for 2020 property taxpayers. Um, a housekeeping note as we get rolling, to help us manage the meeting, I'd ask the public as well as executive and council staff um, to please keep your video off until just before you um, plan to speak. With that, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our June 2nd Cal meeting. So moved. Council member Von Reckbauer has moved adoption, approval of the minutes. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, the minutes were approved. We'll now turn to public comment. Um, though we are getting used to it, having an entirely remote meeting of the Committee of the Whole um, is somewhat unusual for the council. And I wanna be sure that everyone who calls in um, understands the rules for public comment and how the process will be managed. First, our standard ground rules. Public comment must be related to items on today's meeting agenda and must not be used for the purpose of assisting a campaign for election of any person to any office or for the promotion or opposition of any ballot proposition. It also should not include obscene speech. If a speaker fails to abide by these restrictions, I will rule them out of order and require them to conclude the testimony um, now I'll describe the process. As members of the public joined the Zoom call, um, you, you were automatically muted. We can see your name or the last three digits of your telephone number. Our, our committee clerk will call the names or numbers. When your name or last three digits of your phone number is called, staff will unmute your line. Please be sure to also unmute your phone if you have muted um, yourself as a courtesy. And before we... Uh, before you begin your testimony, if you might just state your name so, and then pause, we will acknowledge that we can hear you. Um, and then if you begin by saying and spelling your name so we have it accurate for the record. Um, if you wish your video to be turned on for your public comment, please requ request that um, at the beginning 
as you are recognized. You'll have two minutes to speak and you'll hear a timer to go, go off when you've reached two minutes. You can certainly finish your thought, um, but please wrap up your comments to allow the next person to speak. If you go much past your two minutes, I may interrupt and, and ultimately ask you to conclude or be muted. And um, at, if you are listening um, on TV or streaming the meeting for audio um, before your testimony, we'd ask that you please mute those features so that we don't have feedback on the line. Please hang up after you provided your public comment to make it easier to manage the call um, and you can follow the remainder of the meeting on K King County Television, channel 22, or stream online. The link to stream online is on the council's website, which is at www.kingcounty backslash, I'm sorry, www.kingcounty.gov backslash council, and then click on the Watch Us Live button. We'll now go to, go to public comment. Reminder, when your name or number is called, to state your name so we can um, confirm that we can hear you. Um, Madam Clerk, please go ahead um, with public comment. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first caller on the line is uh, Bernadine Docknell. Go ahead, you are unmuted. Great, thank you. Um, I am uh, Bernadine Docknell or Bernie Docknell. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Great, thanks. Last name is spelled D-O-C-H-N-A-H-L. I live at uh, 13200 Lake Kathleen Road in Renton, Washington. I'm currently the chair of the Harborview Board of Trustees. Thank you for considering the Harborview Facilities Improvement Issue. Harborview is a critical asset for our mission population, King County, Washington State, and the region. I support the Harborview proposal before you. It has received unanimous support from the Harborview Board, the Harborview Leadership Group, and the Capital Projects Oversight Committee. The proposal addresses critical medical center needs. A majority of the medical center's facilities are aging and out of date in terms of modern best practice standards for infection control and privacy. Certainly, it's being tested now in the COVID pandemic. Harborview often operates at 100% capacity. On average, 50 patient beds per day cannot be used due to infection control. Harborview provides world-class quality, leadership, and patient care. We can be proud of all of our providers and staff at Harborview. It's an outstanding organization. Help us keep our promises to all the populations that depend upon us. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next caller on the line is Candace Kopchuk. Please go ahead, you're unmuted. Hello, this is Candace, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay. My name is Candace Kachuk, and I'm a concerned citizen of King County. Last Friday, I observed the law and justice meeting that you convened and was glad to see council members who are white, like myself, aligning themselves with the transformative calls for justice that are happening across the country right now. I could sense that many of you believed, as I do, that we white people are endlessly accountable for the way that white supremacy has made a mockery of justice in this country. Today, you have the opportunity to address this mockery by supporting subpoena powers for the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, OLEO. Your support of this provision will assist OLEO in its critically important work. In doing so, you can strike against the white pattern in which the appearance of reform is allowed to cloak the true absence of it. And let me be clear, my urging here is not a criticism of OLEO. I think very highly of its staff, but rather I am hoping that we can arrive at a place where those who have sought to contain OLEO's authority will have their power to do so diminished. Another provision I urge you to move on is one that would make the inquest process for those who are killed by police a truth-finding experience rather than a process that exists to protect police officers. I believe that we can all understand the message from the streets these days. 
the era of covering up the terrorizing, disproportionate, and racially biased actions of police through formal processes is over. It is now time to refashion our system so that it truly serves those who are forever changed by police brutality rather than those who are the source of it. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller on the line is Amy Darling. Go ahead, please, you are unmuted. I did not, I did not uh, intend to sign up. I have nothing to offer other than reiterating Candace's articulate words. Thank you very much. The next caller on the line is Anu Sidhu. I'm trying to unmute you. Can you unmute yourself? There you go. Go ahead, please. Um, I'm not calling in for public comment. I'm sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. The next caller on the line is Carla. I'm trying to unmute Carla. There Hello. you go. Carla Boyer, C-A-R-L-A-B-O-Y-E-R. Thank you. Go ahead, please. I'm... Um, Speaking in support of Olio and in support of um, more authentic um, oversight of the um, actions of the um, Sheriff's Department. The more power a public agency has, the more essential it is, both for the welfare of that agency and for the public, that it has meaningful oversight. Now, in the case of um, the police, they, they have power to um, take away freedom, and they have power to extinguish life. And so it's essential that we have meaningful oversight. Now, um, I agree with one of the council person's comments that a decade of obstination against meaningful oversight by Olio is far too long. And so I'm speaking in support of subpoena power, which is understood by people, right-minded people who want meaningful support as an essential tool for meaningful oversight. And I'm also speaking in support of um, <clears throat> having the sheriff be an appointed office. <clears throat> and finally, there was, a, there was a, a just and necessary movement, I think it's almost been a year ago now, to reform the inquest process in Seattle. And um, so that it, so that the inquest process would be, um, a search for truth rather than a continuation of trauma to the family's impact. And I wish to see that forward. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller on the line is named Carol. I'm trying to unmute you if you'd like to speak Please unmute yourself. There it is. Hi, I'm a staff member. I'm not, I'm not here for public comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, the next speaker is listed as Equity and Education Coalition. I'm trying to unmute you if you'd like to speak. Go ahead. You might have Name I have is Equity and Education Coalition. If you'd like to speak, please unmute yourself and go ahead. I'll move on to the next one. Who the next person is Fernando Luna. I'm trying to unmute you. You'll have to unmute yourself. There you go. Would you like to speak? Hello, my name is Fernando Luna. I'm a civic engagement coordinator for Intermanos, a Latino LGBTQ plus organization based in Seattle. Race, ethnicity, and sexual orientation are a powerful set of barriers, and yet our communities are persistently underinvested in. 
When PASTA funds were passed, our communities received only 10%. That teeny designation left community-based organizations incapable to lead, board, and be staffed by immigrants, refugees, indigenous people, and other people of color. This is unfortunately happening again in this current public health crisis. Latinos come for 41% of the COVID-19 cases in the state of Washington. Despite that we are only 13% of the whole state population. This is the equivalent of a genocide to our communities. I know there is a lot of talk of equity and uh, other stuff, but I'm asking you council members, will you allow for the CARES budget to help more crumbs while our community die and is infecting others? Thank you. Thank you. The next caller on the line is Helen Shore Wong. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you. My name is, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Helen Shore Wong and I work with the White Center Community Development Association um, on economic strategies that prevent displacement, especially within our first and second generation immigrant, refugee and black owned business community. Given current COVID-19 funds, council members, please think about what it means to co-create with the community right now. Council, please think about the words racial justice and how those words can be realized. Given the COVID-19 funds, how can council allocate those funds to co-create a true picture of racial justice? We ask that you consider the historical disinvestment in our communities, the crumbs that we continue to receive, the harm and brokenness caused by past decisions, like the one of recent regarding the building of the White Center quarantine site. Displacement within our community has already occurred prior to COVID-19 and it continues to occur with COVID-19 now we are and will experience unprecedented displacement. Residents are asking, how will we pay rent next month? How will I feed my family this month? Leaders are asking, how can we innovate? Council members, the COVID-19 funds already, already allocated are, are really not enough. Show us an allocation of COVID-19 funds that truly co-creates racial justice now. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller on the line is Anja Hellman. Go ahead, please, you are unmuted. Hello, this is um, Anya Hellman. I'm the pastor at uh, North Lake Lutheran Church in Kenmore, Washington. And I just wanted to call to, uh, to state my support for um, allowing subpoena powers to Olio, as well as um, my support for the sheriff to become an appointed office. Like many others who have called in and already um, spoken. I would like to see more accountability with the King County Sheriff's Office, um, and these seem to be good proposal, good good ways to try and make that occur. I'm also not aware. I was just looking on the site to see if I could figure out whether there are term limits for the King County Sheriff's Office right now, um, or for the sheriff. But if if there are not, I hope that there would be, and if there are, I hope that those would continue, um, even if we have this position be appointed. Thank you. Thank you. The next call on the line is James Johnson. Go ahead, please. You are muted. All right. Hello, James Johnson, Common Spelling. Uh, I am the I'm the current president of the Lauren Miller Bar Association. 
And on behalf of the LMBA, we support the charter amendments which concern granting the uh, OLEO subpoena powers and clarification on when inquests can be held. Um, simply put, uh, in times where police accountability is at the forefront of our minds, the necessity for a complete and transparent investigations process is underscored. Uh, without a thorough investigation and transparency to the process, I fear that the same injustices we've seen in minority communities time and time again will continue to happen, which simply cannot occur. I think the message of minority communities to police is clear, and that is stop taking the lives of our black and brown people. Uh, furthermore, if someone's life is taken by law enforcement or as the result of law enforcement's action, the investigation should be um, permitted for that person. Furthermore, to the family of the deceased, they deserve uh, some representation in the inquest process. I think now more than ever, it's, a, it's essential that we have a strong inquest process and the cur current charter language is vague uh, since it's not always clear when a death involves by law enforcement. So again, the LNBA supports the charter amendments. Thank you. The next caller on the line is James Wynn. I'm trying to unmute you. Please unmute yourself. Hi, Sharon. Um, thank you. This is James Wynn. Can you hear me? Yes. Please go ahead. I am I'm speaking as a concerned Kent resident, but also would like to supplement and reaffirm all the prior comments that have been made. Um, I definitely believe that there is ample opportunity for the King County Council to not only take a local and sort of city oriented stand, but a national and global stand too, in the approaches to accountability enforcement, as well as inclusive equity and the way that they not only allocate resources, but also continue to engage in the conversations with the community members that continually reach out to them. Um, in particular, I'm speaking to, I believe it is your briefing number 2020B0051 on the agenda today. Um, I apologize if that's the incorrect one. I'm a little anxious and this is unfamiliar with the space for me. However, um, I'd like to still speak about the summary and um, the board. I believe it's called the, the budget crosswalk that the King County Council has shared to the public not too long ago. I've noticed that there seems to be a growing divide in terms of um, Oh, divide wouldn't be the word that I preferably would like to use, but in terms of the um, budget allocations that are being given and sort of um, used to support communities of colors, minorities, and those um, that are mo mostly marginalized and underrepresented, not only in this conversation in this space, but in our own like um, local communities in the schools and in the public spaces that are currently shrinking. Um, global pandemics, climate change, um, technological revolutions, um, the growing elderly populations and those that are more vulnerable and more susceptible to um, not only systemic and institutionalized oppressions and forms of trauma um, are not only being exasper exasperated and um, unhelped in these times as um, a, on a personal level. Um, I know that there are a lot of people doing the work out there right now. And all of this is to say that I would strongly advocate for a King County Council to take a stand and to be able to use and um, clarify every avenue that they have to be able to support this um, collective movement as well as um, transformative um, trauma relieving change that our society so needs today. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. The next caller on the line is Jenna Franklin. Go ahead, you are muted. Uh, oh, shoot. Now I don't know how I'm. We can hear you, go ahead. Oh, you can, sorry. Um, no, I didn't wanna provide any comment, I apologize. That's okay, thank you. The next caller on the line is Joseph Shoji Lachman. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Oh, hello, council members. Um, my name is Joseph Shoji Lachman. Um, I'm the policy analyst for Asian Counseling Referral Service. And um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, and I'd like to speak in support of the, um, the county's inquest process, um, the charter amendment, as well as OLEO. And um, first of all, I want to say that we absolutely support the um, uh, OLEO having subpoena power to make sure that they're able to perform a um, thorough investigation. And to build on this, um, we were part of, um, you know, along with others, including um, the Lauren Miller Bar Association and others who are on this call, uh, we were part of the group that worked with um, both the um, county executive's office to strengthen the inquest process. And on top of that, we also worked with Nikita Oliver and others, um, Alejandra Tres and others to, um, to 
make sure that there was a community uh, in com like community of color lens in terms of crafting the charter amendments, which we um, fully support. We absolutely need to um, guarantee that there's um, inquest representation. I think there's a, a strong understanding that uh, families need to have that legal representation to ensure that they have um, equal opportunity for, for seeking justice, um, especially when they've lost a loved one to lethal force by law enforcement. Uh, and then um, there's the need to clarify uh, when a death involves law enforcement. The current language, um, as James mentioned, is vague. And um, in terms of situations, for example, where um, a, a person who was uh, transported to a hospital after an encounter with law enforcement died later and needing to clarify that that is um, a death you know, involving law enforcement and requires um, investigation um, through the inquest process. And I think this also just needs to be said that there's a broader attack going on on the current um, inquest process. And this is a time for the county to stand up and strengthen the inquest process and stand up for black communities and show commitment to racial justice considering that um, uh, the sheriff's office, King County Sheriff's Office, um, cities of uh, Rent, Renton, Kent, uh, Auburn Federal Way still have not backed off of this law, this lawsuit, although the city of Seattle did back off. Um, the letter uh, that we passed around as a, uh, for community sign-ons, uh, at this point has received over 4,500 um, sign-ons, including close to 70 organizations in the King County area as well as, um, you know, as I cited, over 4,000 individuals who have signed on in just a short period of time. And I hope that um, the council will see that this is really uh, something that needs to be fixed uh, now and something that can be done in these times to show um, support for Black communities and other communities that are affected um, disproportionately by police violence. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the line is listed as legal team Zoom. If you'd like to speak, can you please provide your name? Yes, this is Corey Gilmet, C-O-R-E-Y, Gilmet, G-U-I-L-M-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. And I'm an attorney representing family of those killed by law enforcement. I'm testifying here today on behalf of the Public Defender Association. I'd like to first start by thanking Council Members Zahale, Cole Wells, Dembowski, and McDermott for sponsoring the Charter Reform Amendments uh, uh, before the Council today. I'd first, I'd like to support Olio subpoena authority for the reasons others have shared. However, I'd like to spend bulk of my time expressing my support for the proposed improvement to King County's charter language related to inquests. The proposed change to King County's charter enshrines the right to representation for families within the charter itself. When families lose loved ones to actions involving law enforcement, they shouldn't have to foot the bill to be able to participate in the inquest process. The proposed inquest charter change also ensures that any death where law enforcement contributed to the death receives an inquest. Current chartered language, which requires an inquest in deaths involving law enforcement is vague. For example, take a similar death to Manuel Ellis's that we saw recently in Tacoma. Someone dies several hours after being placed in a chokehold. The autopsy lists the cause of death as acute methamphetamine intoxication. However, it appears the chokehold may have also contributed to the death by depriving the individual of oxygen. Under current rules, it's not clear whether an inquest would be called in this situation. The proposed language drafted and passed unanimously by the Charter Review Commission calls for an inquest where any member of a law enforcement agency's action, decision, or possible failure to offer the appropriate care may have contributed to an individual's death. This language provides much needed clarity and will ensure that all deaths that the community expects to receive an inquest will receive an inquest. This, this improvement to strengthen King County's inquest process is important more than now more than ever, and I urge the council to pass this charter amendment with all due speed. Thank you. Thank you. The next person on the line is Lillian Ballesteros. Go ahead, you are muted. This is Lillian, can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay. Hi, my name is Lillian Balleceros and I'm the executive director with the Latino Community Fund, um, as well as Progreso Latino. I'm here to address the CARES budget. 
um, which right now is not looking to reach our community. Um, we every year get to work with tens of thousands of voters in our county across the state, and we co-create, we work with community to create innovative programs in health and around economic development. And we see time and again our smaller Latino groups, our community-led groups, with the proper resources uh, receiving the funds, they actually get to the heart of what community needs and the ideas that community is creating. And it's miraculous, but we don't need miracles right now. We need action. We see that time and time again, even in the midst of this public health crisis that is based in racial injustice, the county has said how they are racially just, a racially just county, and how you want to co-create policy solutions that we need. And yet the investment is not in line with that conversation. It, we do not see that that investment is there. And for true authentic equity, authentic, it's more than words, it's actions. And this is a time for action. We, in order to walk the talk, you need to invest significantly significantly more than the pitiful amounts outlined right now in the executive cares budget. Right now, our communities are going to work every day. They are investing in our community with their bodies, with their lives, with their health. The county needs to invest in us and our communities. These funds need to rescue the disasters that hit our black and brown communities who are hit first, they're hit hardest, they're hit longest when we see something like COVID-19 come through. And the executive cares budget needs to address that. The intersections of police brutality, inequity, these are all rested in root causes and root causes are not going to be, they haven't been, they are not going to be cured by words. We need action. It's time that the county, especially in this health crisis, in this economic crisis, in this community crisis, step up and invest more than words. Your words alone are killing us. We need more of an investment through the executive care budget into communities that are hit by this COVID crisis. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller on the line is Sam F. Mel. Go ahead, you are unmuted. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, my name is Samit Mel and I work with Equity and Education Coalition, uh, the Partners in Change Program. Uh, thank you again, council chair and council members for allowing me to speak um, in support of the Equity and Education Coalition's Partners in Change Program. Um, we definitely want our communities to be invested through the CARES budget. Part, budget. Um, so Partners in Change has been bringing together more than four dozen organizations in the past month to coalesce and respond to the COVID-19 implications on our health, safety, and communities of color, um, specifically working to support our vulnerable communities at the front lines so Partners in Change is strongly positioned as a connected source of trusted advocates um, to do systems work and in connecting our communities to policymakers and government departments. Um, our work involves securing resources to provide to those in need, working to change systems by infusing our racial and social equity and justice principles to transform the way that we work together and also change systems to benefit the most impacted peoples. Um, I would like to ask the council to have Partners in Change be funded at the request that has been submitted to the executive and the county council, because um, these monies will directly support rental and food resources and needs towards grassroots organizations and our communities that we work directly with. Um, it'll also offer the right tools and capacity to strengthen and expand our COVID-19 response and prepare our communities to face the recovery and the possible second wave of COVID-19 that's gonna impact our region. So King County stands to benefit immensely from this investment to the project and to the communities that are impacted and from the engagement that provides necessary resources to our communities. Um, as we know, strong regions require strong communities and strong communities need strong investments and long-term relationship building. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller on the line is Savong Lam. I've unmuted you, please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Um, uh, good afternoon, my name is Savong Lam and I am with the Cambodian American Community Council of Washington. Uh, we have over 14 Cambodian American organizations um, throughout the state of Washington that is currently part of our council. Um, and today we wanted to show support um, 
and request that you support the Partners in Change program. Uh, for the past month that we've been involved, um, our Cambodian community have been directly and indirectly impacted by COVID-19. And uh, we definitely would appreciate your support and um, so that you can then support our community as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, the next caller on the line is listed as Tenants Union of Washington. If you could uh, give us your name, you can go ahead. You're unmuted. Thank you. Um, my name is Violet Lavatai. I'm the director of the Tenants Union of Washington. And I'm actually here to speak about the executive care budget. And right now, uh, we operate a hotline where tenants call in. Um, there are a lot of tenants right now who are experiencing not receiving their unemployment checks. And what I'm calling about is, what I'm coming to testify about is getting funding um, to organizations who are already on the front line, like United Way, um, expanding some of the programs that exist right now in King County to further out the help to the community. Um, we get calls daily. Our, our hotlines right now is overwhelmed with calls coming in and we're trying to um, get as many resources connection to them. Um, a lot of tenants right now can't um, pay their rent. And so the fear is not receiving the funding that they're supposed to get right now. And we're asking King County to fund the programs to get more money in um, communities, um, vulnerable, marginalized communities right now who need the help so much. And so we're taking and fielding in calls, getting them connected to resources and United Way is helping in rental assistance, expanding and investing in food programs that are, that will help communities all over King County. Um, and so that is my ask today. Um, I'm, I just received three more calls this morning that are in fear of losing their, their, their homes and stuff, not being able to uh, pay their rent or even get food. Um, and so what we're trying to do is get as many resources together to send it to them and um, hopefully that you would invest in uh, programs that are already existing right now to give them more funding to help more people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Velma Valoria. You, I'm trying to unmute you. Please unmute yourself. And there you go. Yes, thank you. Good afternoon, Chair McDermott and members of the council. Thank you for having us, um, for taking us to um, testify this afternoon. My name is Velma Valoria, V-E-L-O-R-I-A. I'm a former Washington State Representative, and I work with the Equity and Education Coalition Partners in Change Program. We appreciate the funding for community services, but really there's something big missing, and that is funding for community-based organizations led by people of color to deal with the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on our communities. The EEC Partnership in Change Program has asked um, for $2.5 million to provide um, food and rental assistance, mask, gloves, and um, san hand sanitizers. We also are providing translation for public health information in 60 different languages. We ask that oh, financial support for small and micro nonprofit community organizations to have their resources and infrastructure to respond to their needs. We're also doing something that's really um, first of the kind. We're mapping out technology, hardware, and internet deserts throughout King County. We are mapping out cultural, ethnic, and linguistic assets of the CBO to facilitate engagement with government agencies. We are ensuring kids have the necessary technology and internet connection needed to continue their virtual education. We truly, truly want to be a partner with King County Council and King County government to increase our own advocacy um, 
presence and propose and guide ongoing and future response to current and future gen, um, emergencies. So we ask you to take mm -hmm. us as a partner and work with us to continue our um, work in the communities. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller on the line has last three digits of their phone number as 084. Go ahead, please. You are unmuted. Hello, my name is Asela Fetch Evans, A-S-E-L-E-F-E-C-H, last name Evans. I work with the Housing Development Consortium. I've been involved with Partners in Change for the past month and have seen the direct um, impact Partners in Change is providing to um, communities during, this, um, during the pandemic. Partners in Change, unlike a, a lot of um, organiz organizations, has been able to effectively bring together policymakers, decision makers, and stakeholders to meet the immediate needs of communities of color who are mostly impacted um, by the pandemic right now. Partners in Change is also reflective of the communities that are being hit hardest with this pandemic, and I believe um, they would be able to meet their needs um, given that they reflect that population. I highly urge um, the County Council and County Executive Dow Constantine to fully fund Partners in Change ask of 2.5 um, million so that we can directly support um, and continue this important work of uh, racial justice and serving the communities that are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. The next line has the last three digits of the phone number as 951. Go ahead, please. Last three digits of your phone number, 951, and you are unmuted. Please go ahead. If you don't wish to speak, will you just let us know? 951, 206, and then 951. I'm not sure they're still on the call. Okay. I will. Where were you started? Oh, 951, still here, but not speaking. Right, I'll just move on. The next person on the line has uh, last three digits of 139. Go ahead, you are unmuted. Yes, my name is Marilyn Covarubia. Can you um, speak for me, please? Hello? Yes, can you spell your name for me, please? It's C O V is in Victor, A R R U B is in Boy, I A S. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Okay, um, I'm just I'm just calling to to say uh, just a few things. I have a statement. Um, all people are impacted, but especially people of color, by the police department department. Uh, my name is Marilyn Covarrubias. I am the mother of Daniel Covarrubias, who was killed in Lakewood, Washington on 4-21-2015. Essential oversight, subpoena power is crucial. As we can see, we've seen in the Man Emmanuel, or Emmanuel Ellis uh, situation, Ram Ramsdale, the chief of police, he said that he didn't know about the uh, autopsy findings, that it was ruled a homicide. Um, but he was killed by oxygen deprivation. Um, I feel that this is, this is incompetent on his part, or he just doesn't care. Um, traffic stops that end in, uh, that should have ended in a ticket end in death. Walking home from the hospital ended in death for my son. Incidents where people call in and ask for help for their for their family member because they're attempting suicide and in death because the police come and kill them. Qualified immunity and the unions that protect police officers from accountability and prosecution are wrong. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments. 
Mr. Chair, I believe I've called everyone on the line. I need to unmute myself. Um, equity in education, is that Sharon? Are you still on the line? Did you wish to offer testimony? I'm looking to see if I can unmute. Equity in education, unmute. I can't unmute. Can you, Ms. Daly? No, I wasn't able to also. I think that person needs to unmute themselves. If that is Sharon and you wish to testify, if you please try to unmute yourself. Not seeing that happening, Madam Clerk, I would ask you to um, unmute all of the attendees for a moment. I, it may be chaotic um, if there's background noise, but I wanna ask if everyone has had a chance to testify. I have unmuted everybody, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Is there anyone who can um, speak up now who has not had a chance to offer public testimony and would like to? Anyone hearing no one? Hearing no one, I'll close public testimony. I want to thank everybody. Mr. Chair, I'm going to unmute. I'm going to mute everyone now, and I'm not sure if that's going to mute you. So please. I'll check. be prepared. Here we go. I am muted everybody. And I've unmuted myself. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Thank you. We'll close the um, public hearing and that takes us to item five on today's agenda. Um, for the first discussion item, we have Tillery Williams and Andrew Kim from Council's Central Staff here to provide a briefing on the COVID-19 supplemental budget that was transmitted last week. This is the third um, COVID supplemental budget transmitted since um, we've been addressing the pandemic here in King County. And Dwight Dively and Aaron Rubart um, from the Office of Performance Strategy and Budget are here to answer questions as well. Mr. Um, Williams, um, Mr. Kim, the, the line is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Tillery Williams, Council Central Staff. I will begin with the staff report, which begins on page nine of your agenda packet. Proposed ordinance 2020-211 would make a total supplemental appropriation of approximately $70.4 million, of which $19.4 million would be made to general fund agencies, $36.5 million to non-general fund agencies, and $4.5 million to capital improvement programs. The June COVID-19 emergency omnibus would be the third emergency um, uh, supplemental appropriation ordinance to date. Moving along to page 10, table one provides a summary of all of the emergency omnibus legislations that have been adopted thus far by this council. In March, council appropriated a total of $27.4 million. And with the April omnibus council appropriated a total of 62.9 million. Again, for this particular omnibus, the executive is proposing a total of $70.4 million. Uh, the executive expects to transmit two more COVID-19 emergency omnibus legislations later in the year. The Office of Performance Strategy and Budget anticipates transmitting the fourth omnibus on August 13th and the fifth omnibus on August, uh, October 15th. Also beginning on page 10 is table two, which provides a summary of each of the appropriations included in the proposed ordinance. Uh, I will briefly go through these and try to get through them as quickly as possible. Um, the first request of $1.5 million to the Office of Emergency Management would fund upgrades and replacement of mission critical audiovisual components to support continued COVID-19 response operations. According to the fiscal note, not replacing the equipment jeopardizes uh, continuity of the response and the health and well being of King County first responders. There's also a request of roughly $12.3 million uh, from the Office of Emergency Management to pur purchase non medical personal protective equipment to provide across uh, county government as well as to businesses, community based organizations, and faith based organizations. Superior Court is requesting $4.3 million in temporary support for remote video conferencing and evidence sharing in all Superior Court courtrooms. 
This appropriation would enable the courts to start working through its lengthy case backlogs due to the required COVID-19 related closure. Um, moving on to page 11, uh, the next couple of items in the summary for Superior Court includes a request of $67,000 for the purchase of sanitation supplies, including masks, gloves, surface wipes, and sanitizer to be used by staff, jurors, and the public, uh, and a request of $12,000 for the purchase of COVID-19 related workplace accommodation uh, supplies and equipment, including plexiglass screens for high volume courtrooms, uh, accessory equipment for working at home and portable video carts to provide immediate accommodations for courtroom hearings that need to be done by video. Uh, the Department of Judicial Administration is requesting $256,000 for the purchase of sanitation supplies and uh, tip temporary reconfiguration facility costs to continue operations during the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, next, there is a general fund transfer request of $1 million to the Department of Local Services uh, Permitting Division. This would support the con uh, continuity of government operations for the permitting staff uh, the monies would be transferred uh, to local services to fund the retention of permitting staff in March and April as a result, uh, as a result of a 50% decrease of fee revenue due to the public health emergency orders. Uh, the next item on the list is a request of roughly $1.4 million to the Water and Land Resources Division to implement a grant program to provide economic support specifically to King County farmers and farm businesses. According to the executive, this program would include grants to farmers markets for business interruption, grants to farmers for personal protective equipment, grants to farms for technology upgrades to facilitate compliance with social distancing measures, food bank and food pantry support and facilitation of senior center partnerships. Moving on, the next two items would appropriate $3 million uh, to DCHS to contract with United Way to support a food and shelter program to provide food security and to provide rental assistance and eviction pre prevention. There's also a request of $1 million for D DCHS to increase contracts for legal services that focus on COVID-19 related eviction prevention and foreclosure defense. Moving to page 12. Uh, the next three items on the list include a request of $1 million for DCHS to increase contracts for domestic and sexual violence victims uh, services and support. $3 million for uh, DCHS to implement a grant program for shelter and housing providers to support current higher cost operations. And lastly, a request of $900,000 to provide support to the law enforcement assistant diversion programs, COVID-19 response and burying. Uh, moving on to public health. First, there is a request of $4.8 million to provide food security assistance for eligible individuals to purchase food and to strengthen and expand infrastructure for food banks and providers. Uh, the proposed ordinance would also appropriate $297,000 to support hazard pay for Protect 17 represented staff working at care sites, similar to the hazard pay for Washington State Nurses Association members as approved in the last uh, COVID-19 omnibus. There's also a $900,000 request to provide funding to community-based organizations to curb the increased violence associated with the COVID-19 crisis as part of the Zero Youth Detention Initiative. Uh, next is an appropriation request of approximately uh, $1.4 million uh, in expenditure authority for a Health Resources and Services Administration grant to expand COVID-19 testing and medical services for persons experiencing homelessness and to purchase medical supplies and personal protective equipment. Following that is a request for $467,000 in expenditure authority for Ryan, uh, for Ryan White HRSA pass through funding for preventing, pre preparing for, and responding to COVID-19. The Ryan White Act is a federal program that addresses unmet health and social service needs of persons living with HIV across the United States. There are two more requests for expenditure authority for grants uh, under public health. This includes $108,000 for a CDC foundation grant 
which would provide support for contract COVID incident management teams in March and April, and $1 million for a Gates Foundation grant that would create a back uh, communications campaign and address community needs that cannot be covered by other funding sources. The next item is the largest proposed appropriation in the ordinance. The executive is requesting $17.8 million to support public health, uh, health and medical area command operations and COVID-19 response, which would expand staffing, contract labor and supplies, including testing, surveillance, um, isolation, quarantine support services, data analytics and informatics, logistics, planning, emergency operations, and contact tracing. Following that is a proposed increase of $415,000 in budget authority for the airport to support labor, supplies, equipment, and temporary retrofit costs associated with the ongoing COVID-19 response. Uh, FMD internal service is requesting $2.9 million for operating costs and security and food service costs at COVID-19 related leased sites and $900,000 for touchless uh, plumbing fixtures in county owned buildings. There are four items on the list for KCIT. The first item would appropriate roughly $1.1 million to build new network sites in support of the county's response to COVID-19. I'd like to add that six have already been built and three are in the process of getting built. This amount also includes temporary term limited labor resources, staff overtime and equipment needed to build sites. The second item would appropriate $2.4 million to enhance King County's internet connectivity to, uh, to support increased demand for high speed and large volume data during COVID-19. The third item would appropriate $1.1 million to KCIT to acquire new tools and support subscribe for technologies that enhance public outreach and engagement in support of King County's response to COVID-19. And this would be things such as Zoom video conferences, licensing uh, and support. Moving on to page 14, which covers the last three appropriation items. Um, lastly, KCIT is requesting roughly $1.4 million to purchase 875 laptops. This includes a uh, cost of full four year uh, cycle laptop leases from Dell and other peripheral equipment. Uh, the last two items make up the capital portion of the proposed ordinance. As proposed, the ordinance would appropriate $2.5 million for leasing costs for two new COVID related quarantine sites, as well as lease extensions in three, uh, at three existing sites. It would also appropriate $200,000 of additional funding to the existing COVID-19 related modular sites across the county and $1.9 million to fund temporary reconfiguration to floors two and three of the King County Correctional Facility West Wing. This would be for social distancing purposes related to COVID-19. Uh, additional details for each of these items presented in the summary are provided beginning on page 14 of your staff reports uh, and ending at the top of page 25. Executive staff indicate that most of the appropriations included in the proposed ordinance would be fully uh, would be funded by state monies and federal monies that are currently or will be available to the county from the coronavirus aid relief and economic securities or CARES Act, including federal emergency management uh, agency disaster relief funding and the Treasury Department's coronavirus relief fund. Um, I'd like to note that during the week of April 20th, uh, 2020, the county re received uh, $262 million from the Treasury Department's uh, Coronavirus Relief Fund. Executive staff indicate they are making an effort to ensure that the county exhausts all other available state and federal funding before utilizing the $262 million. Executive staff also indicate that most of the expenditures related to the, isoling, uh, to, to the isolation and quarantine sites may be reimbursed through FEMA. Um, executive staff did provide an estimate of how the $262 million um, relief fund dollars would be used. So far, the executive has designated 70% of the proceeds to support county government expenditures 
and the remaining 30% to non-county uh, government expenditures, such as community and economic support and recovery and support for cities and fire districts. Table four on page 26 provides a summary of the estimate um, and the funds that would remain should the proposed ordinance be adopted. As shown in the table, 125 million would be reserved in anticipation of a second wave of coronavirus cases later this calendar year, and $50.6 million remains undesignated. One thing to note though is um, any new allocations should be consistent with the coronavirus relief fund guidance. Any expenditures that are incurred, audited, and ultimately deemed unallowable will likely have to be covered by the general fund or another appropriate revenue source. Uh, a key limitation is the prohibition um, on revenue replacement, meaning the coronavirus relief fund cannot be used to pay any taxes, permits, or fees paid to the county. Uh, beginning at the bottom of page 26 of the staff report is a selection that summarizes the June 2020 Office of Economic and Financial Analysis Revenue Forecast for the county. And lastly, uh, on page 28 is table five, which provides a timeline of the activities that would need to be conducted in, in, in anticipation of uh, possible action on this proposed ordinance. And that would take place at the June 23rd council meeting. Uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes my remarks and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, Mr. Williams, a, a, I wasn't keeping tally of the numbers, but a substantial amount of the expenditures, at least in the first um, half of the table as you went down, was for um, personal protective equipment, PPE, um, sanitary wipes, other such materials that at least earlier in the pandemic were in um, short supply. Do we have an indication about our ability to secure the quantities that we'd be budgeting at this time? Yes, in the staff report, uh, let me find it here. Um, on page, one, I'll just go ahead and say that uh, PSB has stated that they are working, they have identified some vendors that could provide large uh, quantities of this, of, of these uh, equipment at little to no cost. And they are expecting shipments of this equipment within the coming weeks. Okay, thank you. Um, Councilmember Dombowski, and then um, others who have questions, but um, I know Councilmember Dombowski has a question. Councilmember? Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and sorry, I'm receiving a delivery of about 25,000 county masks right now, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, I'll show you the truck. We've got our county employees on the job. Uh, for distribution into the community. Hey, I had a question, Tillery. I really appreciate your comprehensive staff report. Really excellent and understandable. Um, but I, I had a question just drilling down a little bit on the surface water management uh, fund and the transfer of, uh, what is it, 1.2 or $3 million to support look like ag-related and farmer's market programs. Um, you know, we in the budget committee have really uh, worked hard to, to try and build that fund up to meet critical water quality management needs. Um, and it is a charge um, in the unincorporated areas on property um, taxes. And it can, it's a significant amount of money. But I was just surprised to see the proposed use of those funds, which is my understanding is a utility. And I I want. I wonder what the nexus is to to water quality. It looked like uh, I saw in the footnote it was tied to maybe supporting ag lands, but I'm just wondering if if there's a what the nexus is there. If those truly are swim water uh, dollars that are proposed. Uh, Councilmember Dembowski, I don't have the answer to that, but we do have Director Dively on the line. If he would like to step in. Yes, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Great. Um, so Council Member Dambowski, the proposal is to use some of the federal funds for this purpose. It goes through that particular fund just because that's where the agriculture programs are. 
but we are not proposing to use utility revenue for this. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> that, that makes more sense. Uh, and uh, just while well, I've, I've got the opportunity here, the, with respect to the uh, lead dollars, $900,000 um, for the Burien work, is that, um, help me understand that a little bit, is that to help mitigate with some of the uh, loss of mid, mid dollars, but, but trying to shift it to new programming so it's not revenue replacement? How's that, how's that working? I had to unmute myself. Um, so this is because LEAD is doing things that were not originally budgeted in response to COVID. And the staff report actually has some detail about that, like hotel rooms and things like that. So this is in no way replacing mid-funding. It is incremental costs associated with COVID that would be supported with federal funds. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and thank you, Tillery, for the great report. Colleagues. Member. Council Member Lambert. Thank you, sir. Um, so two questions. Um, number one, um, I'm glad that Dwight is here on the line and Tillery and others. I just got off a very interesting um, phone call with the state auditor and a crew. And there were some interesting new pieces of information that I will type up and send to you later today about documentation of these expenditures that I had not heard before. So I will let you know what I learned a few hours ago. Um, on the masks, I see that we will give two masks to every person in the county. Um, I know in my house, I bought four for me and two for my husband. Um, so not everybody's going to need two masks. So how did we, I see that we're going to get new shipments every three days. Is there a possibility um, maybe um, the 25,000 at Rod's house may um, go pretty fast, but um, if we don't end up needing as many, because that is an $11 million expenditure, just a huge expenditure, is there any way of scaling back? I realize that these are reimbursable from the federal government, but the federal government is also our money indirectly. So um, I would like to know that. And the second thing is that as we go forward, I understand, so um, I'd like to know, um, verify this, that for the people who are in our hotels right now, in our centers, it's $155 a day for each person in there. And I'd like to look at how, over time, we can begin to see how to reduce that cost. It's a pretty high cost, um, and so I'd like to know those two things. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Lambert. Uh, staff can definitely follow up on those things and get it get back to you. Further questions, colleagues? Council Member Cole Wells. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions. Um, of probably Dwight, but perhaps of Tillery. First of all, with regard to the United Way appropriation for assistance in food security and rental assistance, uh, I have all the respect in the world for United Way. I'm just wondering why though that organization was selected, uh, how much would go into overhead, if anything, uh, and is this decision or this determination based on uh, inadequate capacity at the county to be able to handle a distribution of the funds? Um, Tillery here, Tillery here. Uh, I, I, I did speak with PSB and it is um, a capacity issue. The thinking behind that was that United Way had the capacity to hit the ground running right away. Now, with the overhead costs, I would have to defer to Director Dively uh, to answer that question. So, Council Member, I don't know the answer to that question, but it's an easy one to find out. Okay. I know they're doing things with basically their existing staff, so whatever overhead cost there is should be quite modest. 
but we'll get you an answer to that question. Okay, thank you. And to follow up on that, um, we heard quite a lot of compelling testimony from uh, individuals who are involved with partnership and change. And I've been uh, very impressed with the work that they've done and the proposal that they made, which I did see several weeks ago. And it's a coalition of, I think they said over four dozen community-based organizations. Would that be some type of organization that would be, in your mind, would be able to distribute some of the funds, especially in uh, those community uh, communities that have um, had difficulties in accessing racial justice, but also uh, really have a need for the resources? Yeah, so they are eligible to apply for the funding um, through the RFP processes that we're running. Uh, so usually the practice we have is to not uh, just designate one in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, unless there is some particular reason that you need to do that and some special advantage. Uh, so they would, we would expect that they would be applying for a share of the funds. Um, I, we can tr get you more information about that if you're interested. I appreciate that. And are you talking about applying for funds from United Way or for other parts of this funding? For other parts that are relevant, um, you will recall that you, the council has already appropriated $2 million for working with these kinds of organizations. So um, there's a variety of different uh, sets of money that are available to support these kind of groups that are, are working in our communities. Right, and just to let everybody know, I'm intending to increase, uh, to add in additional funds for that ESJ uh, part of the funding that we provided in the previous two COVID budgets. Uh, another question has to do with uh, Gates Foundation grant. Is this awesome pass through one? Do we get federal funds or could you let us know more about that? Councilmember, I believe that the Gates Foundation money is their money they are granting to public health. It would not involve federal money in any way. And the advantage of it, it provides some communication support that we don't believe we have other funding sources to support. Thank you. And lastly, with regard to KCIT, I see $2.4 million for internet connectivity to support increased demand for high speed and large volume data during COVID-19. Do you know where that money is intended to be spent? Um, I know some of it would go internally for county departments uh, and perhaps for the libraries, it appears, but what about really getting funding out for, as was brought up by a couple of our people testifying for individuals, families, for students who are not able to connect to their schools for remote learning? Um, we'll check, but I don't believe that uh, individuals of that uh, the description you're providing are connected to our network, our INET, or our internal network, and therefore probably benefit from um, this investment. Like, uh, as we discussed previously, Councilmember, I think you have a di somewhat different idea uh, that would be more um, appropriate to reach individuals. We'll work on that. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Zahalai. Councilmember Zahalai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, Dwight. I just want to follow up on Councilmember Colwell's questions. I'm not sh sure if I maybe I just missed it. Um, do we have has the executive tried partnering with smaller community based organizations that do food assistance and rental assistance programming? You know, we heard from the, the, the Partners uh, for Change Coalition during public comment, for example. I think we often hear an, uh, a justified frustration from smaller CBOs that have better relationships with community, how they're not getting supported, but bigger, bigger, uh, bigger nonprofits are. So it, I'm just thinking through, uh, wondering why United Way for these $3 million rather than smaller CBOs that have closer connections to community? So let me give you a partial answer to that question, Councilmember, and then I think we need to have DCHS follow up with you. 
um, and with the council generally. So one of the things we are trying to do is get money out as quickly as we can once you appropriate it. And organizations like the United Way who already are set up to do that can do it very quickly. Um, and so that's kind of the rationale for doing it. As I mentioned earlier, uh, DCHS would also be working with um, uh, potentially with RFP processes to involve other groups in doing that as well. But I want to, uh, I don't know the details of whether some of the groups who testified today already have relationships with DCHS. Um, and so let me get back to them and find out what exists already today that, you know, if the council were to direct it, that we could easily uh, get resources out through those other networks. Thank you, Dwight. That, that would be great. I, I know for a fact there are several smaller CBOs that already have the capacity to do rental assistance and uh, food banks that serve particular neighborhoods in, in all of our district that would love this kind of support. So um, I would appreciate if we directed our energy toward that alternative moving forward. <clears throat> Further questions? Councilmember Cole Wells? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just would like to again thank the staff. Tillery and Andrew have been phenomenal and really did great work on the staff report. But I'd also like to remind uh, my colleagues that we will be uh, welcoming your suggestions for, a, for what we will include in a striking amendment. Uh, those suggestions in the way of either actual language or concepts should get to uh, Tillery and Andrew by this Thursday at noon. We will then come out with a striking amendment, hopefully by Friday afternoon, maybe over the weekend. But I think we can likely at least provide a, a memo with concepts of what are what will be included in the striking amendment by Friday and then following up with actual language as soon as possible on Saturday or Sunday, and then we'll be welcoming your uh, line items, uh, line amendments on by Monday at noon. And the plan is that we will vote on the striking amendment at the council meeting next Tuesday, the 23rd. Tillery, do you wanna add anything more to that? No, I, I, I think that um, sums up everything. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Councilmember Belducci has a question. I see C Councilmember Up the Grove raising his hand as well. And, but I do want to let my colleagues know that I need to step away for a minute. So I'm going to hand the gavel to Councilmember Belducci. And with that, Councilmember Belducci, there you go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Thank you. And I apologize. So uh, I'll call on Councilmember Up the Grove next, and I'll hold on uh, to give my comments in a moment. Councilmember Up the Grove, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Tillery, uh, for the, the largest appropriation, the 17 million for public health, what does the budget bill say about how that money has to be spent? I know you in your staff report, you gave a narrative of the kinds of things they were interested in spending on it, but do we put any constraints on it or is that just funding that we just give kind of a, a blank check? And I don't mean that in the pejorative sense, but do we give a, we're just gonna give 17 million to public health or are there constraints in the budget bill that limit or specify how it can be spent? So, so usually when an executive um, shares with us any proposals, um, the council does have the ability to go in and, and restrict some of those funds, but um, I would have to defer to uh, Director Dively. Um, the only information that we were provided was what uh, was in the fiscal note, um, but other than that, I'd have to defer. So, Councilmember Up the Grove, um, the way the legislation is written, uh, there is no detailed restriction on the money that we are requesting for public health. Um, clearly, it will have to comply, since we're intending to use federal money, it will have to comply with the federal restrictions. So, it will have to be incremental COVID-related costs, can't be revenue replacement. It has to be spent before the end of the year, all of those kind of things. But otherwise we are providing a you know, general list of the kind of things public health is doing, uh, mostly expanding testing and expanding contact tracing. Okay. 
Um, we did not uh, have a level of detail that's a whole lot more specific than that. Um, if there's interest in the council in writing some language that um, you know either prevents it from being used for a particular thing or ensures that some of it is used for a particular thing, uh, we're happy to work with you on that. I was, if I may follow up, Madam Chair, um, I was more interested in sort of where the number comes from that if we don't have that level of detail, why is it 17.4 instead of 16.5 or, you know, where? Yes, so it is, um, and obviously this is now about 10 days old from the executive side. It was the estimate that public health had at the time for that body of work, you know, counting short-term temporary employees, estimating how much they would be paid, how much test kits would be. Um, I, I guarantee you that if we ask them today to recalculate the number from scratch, it would turn out slightly differently because we'd have different assumptions about things. And so it, it is frankly just an estimate and it probably has some false precision to the, the detail of the number. Do we allow, does, do our budget systems allow for sort of real time tracking? For example, when we get our next COVID uh, omnibus, is it sort of reconciled if they ended up spending less or more than that, then we adjust the, I assume this is for a, a time duration, that estimate is to get us through to the. Yeah, so that estimate was for from basically now to the end of the year for this set of activities. Okay. Um, so if, um, I'm, I'm just completely making this up. If um, a month from now, we get new guidance from the federal government um, about public health should be doing this other thing we have not been doing, then they'll come back and say, okay, then we need $2.63 million from August to the end of the year to do this new thing. Um, and yes, we do, obviously, uh, at the end of every month, we figure out what we've spent. And in some cases, we'll be back to you asking you for more money. In other cases, we'll probably be able to say, hey, that didn't cost as much as we thought. So we're going to, in, in essence, turn back $2 million uh, back into the pool, and we'll ask for a different use of it. Okay. And finally, I'll be super quick, Madam Chair. I don't even need an answer, but... Uh... Would you, at any time, Dwight, you see us venturing on an expenditure that has some risk or uncertainty that could end up in us having to use general fund? Will you let us know? Yes, and, and we work very closely with your staff about things like that. So they'll ask, hey, we have this idea that's coming from a council member. Does it fit? Um, we're happy to give that feedback. We also have outside legal counsel we can consult with, and we've done that several times. And they've told us, yeah, that's okay, or mm, probably you shouldn't do that. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from other members before I Chair. Councilmember Lambert. Thank you. Just piggybacking on what the previous speaker said, I too am concerned at some of the reasonableness of the cost. We were putting, I think we now put in $2 million for outreach to inform about COVID. At this point, I think everybody knows COVID exists. So those expenditures may be difficult ongoing to, um, to rationalize. So I am concerned that we look at some of the expenditures at this point and say, is that still necessary at that range? Because I think it's going to be difficult to verify some of this if it doesn't change amounts. Thank you. Thank you. Any other members? Okay, uh, my comments, uh, I want to underscore something that our budget chair, uh, Council Member Cole Wells said, this, uh, this um, proposal is gonna be moving through council at a speed that I don't believe I've ever seen before. We're having this briefing today and then next Tuesday in full council, we're expected to take up any amendments and vote. So uh, it's gonna go very, very fast and um, I wanna say a couple things. First of all, I wanna suggest that since we're having a series of COVID budgets um, and non-COVID budgets that will be coming through uh, over the next several months, if you see something in here or you don't, rather if you don't see something in here that you feel is missing that can be added, we will have future opportunities to do that. And I just think we should all keep that in mm -hmm. mind rather than trying to come up with programming like in five business days, right? Um, 
Secondly, uh, uh, Councilmember Colwells, I want to just thank you and remind everyone that uh, she's been leading us through a process where we went through a, a surveying of the membership, put down our top priorities, found a lot of coalescing around principles. We adopted a principles document. And in my opinion, this proposed budget, if, when you look at the community-based support areas that are being proposed, really responds to that. So we found, I think, a place of um, some uh, coordination or coalescing between the branches and among the offices in the council. Uh, I'm pleased to see the focus on survival type supports like rental assistance, keeping a roof overhead, food assistance, keeping food on the table. And I think what we heard from the community uh, members who testified today was not don't do that, but rather there are specific areas in, the, in specific communities that are, spe that are suffering uh, intensely and acutely, and we should make sure that the money gets to the people who are suffering intensely and acutely. Uh, I'm gonna be asking my colleagues, uh, and, and I'm gonna work with the budget chair to see if we can't do more now. We've had a number of reports about how much COVID CARES Act funding is coming to the county. Uh, we need to be cautious, I agree, and you know, per our adopted statement, make sure that we are preserving enough of that money to support the very expensive public health work we still have to do. The contact tracing is going to be critical and it's gonna to have to go on for a long time. So uh, we wanna make sure that we don't overspend and not have money to do those kinds of activities. However, it does seem to me that somewhere within the 260 million that we received from CARES Act funding that we could do more than uh, what we're talking about here to support the community now when the need is the most acute and the most challenging. So I'm gonna be asking that we look at that uh, between now and next Tuesday and hopefully um, support a striking uh, amendment that will will address that. Um, that's it, I just really wanted to give us a, a comment, not not uh, not ask a question. But if anybody, staff or uh, Mr. Dively wanted to respond to that, please feel free to do so. Okay, not seeing anybody. Uh, council member. Council. Oh yeah, Council Member Cole Wells, please go ahead. I mentioned your yes, name. Thank you. Very, thank you very staff. much, <laughs> um, Madam Chair. And I appreciate your bringing up that we do have a couple of more COVID budgets. I just want to uh, remind my colleagues on the council, but this could be information that could be helpful to the public. Uh, besides this COVID budget three before us now, which we hope to take action on next Tuesday at our council meeting, we also will have transmitted likely this week the third omnibus from the current biennium, uh, and that will be taken up in July, so we don't have to deal with that at the same time as this COVID budget. Uh, the fourth COVID budget is likely to be transmitted mid-August, and we were we are projecting council action on that on September 1st or thereabouts. We also have the biennial budget for 2021 to 2022 coming up and it will be transmitted on or about September 22nd and the projected council passage for that is November 17th. But we as well will have likely have a fifth Council a COVID budget uh, to be transmitted on or about October 15th, and a fourth omnibus uh, supplemental budget for this current biennium uh, also projected to be transmitted on October 15th, and both of those would likely be taken up for action by the Council on December 8th. I also will be getting a format to all of you within the next week to get your recommendations for what will go into the, uh, the biennial budget so that the executive can plan for trying to accommodate our policy and funding priorities. So watch for that in the next few days. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Cole Wells. All right, I think that's a, probably a good point to uh, wrap up this item unless there's any final words from anyone on the panel or any members. Okay, uh, so we will move on. This was not for action today. This is going to be uh, on the council agenda next week. This brings us to item number six, which is a proposed ordinance number 2020-0176, which would place on the November ballot, a bond proposal for public health 
safety and seismic improvements at Harborview Medical Center. We're gonna have a briefing on this in a moment, but I just wanna alert folks that when the briefing is done, we will be going into executive session, which means that the council members will leave this Zoom meeting. The Zoom meeting will continue without us in it. We are going to another meeting to have our executive session to discuss an item that I will describe if the chair isn't back. And, uh, and then we will come back into this Zoom meeting to take final action on the Harborview bond and move uh, on in our agenda. So uh, that'll all be announced and, and uh, flagged as we go ahead, but I wanted to make sure people knew that was coming. And before that, uh, we have a, a briefing from our council central staff, Sam Porter and Nick Bowman. Uh, why don't you are, you, are you on the line, Sam or Nick? Yes. Sam, I, why don't you go I, ahead and start the briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Materials for this item begin on page 67 of your packet. Um, as the committee was previously briefed on this item at the May 19th meeting, I will just provide a very quick high level overview today and lead with the only notable change since May 19th being the revised Office of Economic and Financial Analysis or OEFA uh, forecast that was released earlier this month. This forecast anticipates significantly lower assessed values than previous forecasts the result of which being that while the average rate of approximately eight cents per thousand dollars of assessed value has not changed for the proposed Harborview bond, the average increase in property taxes is now estimated to be approximately $75 annually for a homeowner over the life of the proposed bond. This is $7 more than estimates um, previously provided based on the August 2019 OEFA forecast and that was included in the previous staff report for this item. The staff report in your packet has been revised to reflect this change. The proposed ordinance 2020-0176 would place a 20-year $1.74 billion capital improvement bond on the November 2020 general election ballot, the proceeds of which would go towards new construction, renovation, seismic retrofitting, and other health and safety improvements of Harborview Medical Center facilities. Attachment A of the proposed ordinance provides a high level overview of the improvements, which may be funded with levy proceeds. These improvements are based on the Harborview Leadership Group recommendation report that was transmitted to council on April 8th of this year. This report requested through motion 15183 provides background and detail on the Harborview Leadership Group efforts and summarizes the size and scope of their bond recommendation. In order to meet the election's deadline to include the proposed bond on the November ballot, the last regular council meeting to adopt with maximum processing time is July 7th. The deadline for elections to receive the effective ordinance is August 4th. And that concludes my remarks. I'm happy to answer any questions and we have Nick Bowman available as well. Thank you, council member Belducci. Um, are there Council member, are there questions? Council members, are there questions? This is our second briefing on the item. Seeing no, Council member Dembowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, uh, and thanks for having this second briefing on this important legislation. Um, Sam, thanks for the report and the updated information with respect to the property taxes. My recollection from uh, reading the materials and the first briefing was that in the first, certainly first year, but maybe even in the second and third, that the, the actual amounts collected are quite small. Um, and it, then it goes and it begins to peak and then tapers off. Um, can you confirm that and and I'm just and then I'm I'm wondering is there any ability I don't know that we'd want to do this but is there an ability to uh, seek approval this November but because the amounts are so small in the first year or two actually delay collection or commence collection uh, sometime say in 2022 or 23 without materially impacting the time or uh, or length of the of the uh, period in which tax is imposed Yes, council member, um, I will direct you to pages 72 and 73 of your packet. Um, this is a revised debt issuance schedule um, with the estimated annual levy rate based on the June 29, 2020 
uh, OEFA forecast. Uh, the first few years, um, the estimated levy rate for 2021 is about uh, 12 cents per thousand dollars and then um, goes up from there. Um, does that kind of get to the answer of your question? Yeah, I, I thought the numbers were quite worse, worse, much smaller in the first year or so. I just must be misrecalling. Um, I believe Patrick Hamker is available to answer this question. Uh, I, I think I think I think Sam just uh, very uh, briefly misspoke. That's not twelve cents. That's point one two cents in the first couple of years. And Sam said twelve cents. It was just an honest mistake. So it doesn't even get to a full penny until the third year. And it's two point eight eight cents. Um, but I was I was coming on the line to get to the second part of your question, uh, Council Member, because it's a little different than what we normally have about can we uh, not. Uh, levy initially. And I think we would ultimately want to ask legal counsel about that. But in general, I believe the answer is yes, because in as opposed to your normal lid lift levies where you say we're going to collect a certain rate per year or up to a certain rate per year, what you approve in bond ordinances is a principal amount up to a certain amount. So what you would probably need to find out in the first couple of years if you didn't want to levy it initially is how you were gonna raise the cash to do the planning and design work in the first couple of years, which is why that rate is so low. It's a small expenditure. If you figure out a way to do that, I do believe you could wait a, a year or two before you started levying it, but it's such a small rate too, that would kind of be a policy option. Yeah, it's um, I, it's such a small rate for a small amount of money. You could maybe look at an interfund um, uh, loan, and I even wonder if the administration of collecting that small amount is is uh, very efficient. So I don't know. We probably lost Dwight Dively, and I don't want to do anything that would take this off of the the track toward a, a strong launch. Um, but given the economic times, it it and the very small sums collected, I know that sounds somewhat inconsistent, but um, uh, I just wonder if we might take a look at that between now and final adoption as to when the um, collections would start. So council member, I'm still here. Oh, Dwight. Um, and, and, and I think uh, Mr. Hammaker had the right idea. You should ask legal counsel, but my recollection when we did something similar many years ago, when I was at the city of Seattle with the libraries for all bond issue, um, if you put a measure on the ballot in a year, I believe the legal advice we received at that time is you have to levy the tax the next year, even okay. at a very small amount. Um, otherwise, you're basically asking voters for something that's uh, speculative and way in advance, and the law, as I remember, does not allow you to do that. Thank you. Appreciate it, Dwight. Mr. Chair, are you looking to advance this to full council today? Not at this moment, I am, but not at this moment. Okay. If there are, are there any other questions? Colleagues, colleagues, I, um, for your information, this is when I would anticipate questions, certainly, which is why I'm asking for questions. And then we do um, have a unrelated matter um, regarding Harborview that I um, will introduce as an executive session and we'll go into executive session before I would be seeking a um, motion on the bond measure, and just so you know what course we're charting here. So questions on the policy of the bond measure. Thank you. I just wanted to know I, in the chart for 20 year that estimated rate is three and a quarter. With what's happening right now, is it a possibility that that estimate actually could be lower? Mr. Hemmaker. Yes. <laughs> I like that concise answer. <laughs> what, what might it be at this point? Well, well council member, remember that because of the schedule, we might issue some debt in the first year, back to council member Dombowski's question, but it'd be for very small amounts to do like planning and design. So when we start to issue the construction debt in maybe three years, the market could be completely different. 
if we were selling 20 year bonds today, I think the rate would be closer to 2% than it was to 3%. But um, because of that, the executive, I think they did, they have brought the estimate for the interest rates down during the, the time the council has been considering it. Uh, but I think they do want to plan to be uh, more conservative than less conservative when they're trying to guess the interest rates for a couple years down the road. Great, right, thank you. Seeing no further questions, um, while not related to the bond proposal, the Harborview Medical Center Board of Trustees has been directly and indirectly authorized, has in, directly and indirectly authorized rental agreements for four properties that are being operated under Harborview's um, hospital license and the rents paid out of Harborview Medical Center revenues. However, both the county code and the hospital services agreement specifically define what properties are considered to be part of the medical center. These additional properties are not included in those definitions. The council needs to go into an executive session to confer with the county's attorneys to ob obtain legal advice of potential actions the county may take related to this matter. Therefore, the grounds for executive session under RCW 4230110 are to discuss with legal counsel legal risks of a um, proposed action when public knowledge regarding the action is likely to result in an adverse legal or financial consequence to the county. The committee will be in executive session for approximately 15 minutes until about um, 3.02. Um, I'm asking Casey, KCTV to please post the virtual meeting to that effect. And I'm asking only council members and any county employees directly necessary for the discussion to join the executive session by Skype at this time. And council members, you may still stay logged in to Zoom. Um, leave yourself muted and, and committee assistants will make sure that you're muted um, when you leave um, Zoom as well. Um, so you can leave Zoom open um, and I will see you in the executive session Skype momentarily. Thank you. All right, then we're coming out of executive session. And um, as we've ascertained that all members are accounted for, um, Council Member Dombowski, I would entertain a motion if you were so inclined. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I move adoption of the Harborview Bond Ordinance. And uh, as the prime sponsor, I defer to you for opening remarks. Thank you, um, Council Member Dombowski, for moving. We give a due pass recommendation to Ordinance 202176. Um, it was my pleasure to serve with um, you, Council Member Dombowski, um, people from um, Harborview, people from um, UW Medicine, um, our labor partners at the hospital, um, neighbors around Harborview on First Hill, and per perhaps most importantly, the mission population the hospital's duty is to serve. Um, and as you already heard when the, the board chair for Harborview Board of Trustees testified during public comment, um, the recommendation from that um, working group was unanimous for the package that has continued from the working group that Councilmember Nabowski and I served on through the Harborview Board, the Facilities Committee, and the executive to arrive to us in the same form. Um, we see now in the middle of a pandemic, the work that Harborview um, and its partner that we contract with to operate at UW Medicine do so well. But to single out and, and be particular, the work that Harborview does as the county hospital, and in fact, serving um, our mission population, recognizing that they have a um, mission to serve um, non-English speaking poor persons, the uninsured and underinsured, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, people incarcerated in our jails, people with mental illness or substance abuse issues, um, those being treated involuntarily, people with um, sexually transmitted diseases and those who um, require emergency trauma or burn care. That's truly the mission population of the hospital and who they serve every day. Um, the bond measure itself um, does some critical work that um, Bernie spoke to in her testimony, particularly um, making the, the hospital rooms single patient because of the number of beds that end up 
unusable on any given night due to infection control, something that I think the layperson is probably more aware of today um, in this pandemic than we might have been before with the um, as we come to understand the transmission of COVID-19. And this is, a, as the current bond measure is expiring, this is our chance to make substantial investments in the Harbor, Harborview campus and truly its mission, including up to 150 respite beds in Harborview Hall while maintaining the um, shelter capacity um, at the most appropriate place within the campus. Um, redesigning the arrival of the medical helicopter, because currently if you arrived at Harborview by helicopter, you, are, uh, you end up being transported from that building to another by ambulance, rather than simply um, an elevator ride down into an emergency room. That, that will be addressed within the bond measure. Um, and enhancing the, greatly enhancing and in, in investing in behavioral health and the investments that are so needed in behavioral health um, with, and our ability to provide support and treatment to people. So I would ask my colleagues to join in this um, in sustained investment, not only in our county hospital, but truly in our community and our own well-being. Further remarks? Seeing none, Met, um, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Balducci? Aye. Council Member Balducci votes aye. Council Member Dombowski? Aye. Council Member Dombowski votes aye. Council Member Dunn? Aye. Council Member Dunn votes aye. Council Member Colwells? Aye. Council Member Colwells votes aye. Council Member Lambert? Aye. Council Member Lambert votes aye. Council Member Uptegrove? Council Member Uptegrove? Council Member Von Reichbauer? Aye. Council Member Von Reichbauer votes aye. Council Member Zahalai? Aye. Council Member Zahalai votes aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. Mr. Ms. Chair? Ms. votes aye. Mr. Chair, the vote is nine, aye, zero, no's. By your vote, we have given a due pass recommendation to um, ordinance 2020-176, and we will send that to um, full council. Um, without, without objection, we will expedite. So it appears at the count, on the council agenda one week from today. See, see no objection, so ordered. Thank you, colleagues. This takes us to briefing 2020 B51. Um, it's a briefing from the Charter Review Commission. You remember that last year, the co-chairs of the Charter Review Commission, Louise Miller and Ron Sims, presented their early report. Today, co-chair Louise Miller is going to provide an overview of the commission process and final recommendations. Then we'll hear from commission members, Alejandra Tres, um, Rob Seca, and on the two charter amendment proposals we are discussing today related to oleo subpoena powers and the county's inquest process. For my um, colleague's reference, the slides for the presentation are included in the Cal packet beginning on page 373 of your packet. Um, with that, um, former council member Miller, the floor is yours. We need, let me unmute you, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My welcome to the council. I can see you've had a lot of really important things that you've been doing. It's been it sounds like it's been a big day. So we'll try to move through this as smoothly as possible. Uh, the overview of the uh, process: uh, twenty-three commissioners were appointed by the executive and confirmed by the council, and we held town hall-style public meetings at the beginning of our work and also. We did the same when we were working on our final recommendations. The commission operated on a consensus model and recommended 11 amendments be placed on the ballot. The recommended amendments in the order that they appear in the charter are 
uh, some changes to the preamble, which I won't go over. Uh, you can go over it in your own report. Uh, but updates and clarifications to the initiative and referendum process. Much has changed over the last several decades in election law, and the Charter has fallen behind on being current with state law. And there are also some sections that would benefit from clarification. So this amendment addresses those issues. Subpoena power for law enforcement oversight. Um, I will briefly read it, but we have, I believe, a commissioner who will cover this issue because I think this is one that you're scheduling to move forward with. Uh, the amendment would add subpoena powers to those listed under the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. Okay, recommended amendments in the order, again, as they appear in the charter, the next would be the additional exempt positions. There's a request from uh, the, count, the county council and the executive, I think. The charter includes specific language around which county positions are exempt from a career service system. This amendment would allow the council to adopt an ordinance changing the exempt positions. Something that surprised me, you did not have any language in the charter that allowed a removal process for elected officials. So we had really top staff work on this and they really researched a lot of this throughout the country. And we found out that, you know, this, the very city we're in, Seattle has this kind of language. So this is what we're proposing to go into the charter. The amendment would allow elected officials to be removed from office by a supermajority of the county council for misfeasance, malfeasance, or violations of their oaths of office. Currently, the only option for removal is a recall election. Here's one that won't be controversial, I'm sure. This is the county sheriff suggestion to revert it to an appointed position. This amendment would revert the office of county sheriff to that of an appointed official whereby the executive would appoint and the county council would confirm the county sheriff. Next comes the increased anti-discrimination protections. This amendment would add protections against discrimination for family caregivers, honorably discharged members of the military, and add protections to those discharged solely because of their sexual orientation or gender identity. We also have additional requirements for inquests. This is one that you will get more information on, I feel. This amendment will require that an attorney be appointed for family matters involved in inquests and require an inquest to be conducted when a member of law enforcement may have contributed to the death of a person in custody. Another one that's in relationship to something the state has changed is affordable housing, the property sales. Current properties owned by agencies that used to be part of the Metropolitan Municipality of Seattle are required to be sold for full value. At a recent change in state law allows the property to be sold for less than full value if it's going to be used for affordable housing. This would correct this conflict and allow for these types of transactions. And I know there's been discussion about this because we know that we just don't have all of the housing that we need for our workforce and for our low income friends. Then there are some omnibus changes there are two amendments to make a series of changes throughout the document. These include typographical and grammatical, an amendment containing a series of typographical and technical changes throughout the charter. And also we decided to revise the concept of citizenship throughout the document. This amendment revises all references to citizenship except one. The amendment changes the term of citizen to either resident when describing a person or public when describing things like public participation. There is one reference to the citizenship left in regarding the need to be a citizen to hold elective office, which is a requirement of state law. The Charter Review Commission believes very strongly that the County Council should place all 11 of these amendments. However, we realize 
that that might be too much to go on one ballot. So we are saying that uh, we think you might need to decide which would be the first batch and which would be the second batch. Uh, that depends on your discussions and debate and whether you think you could present all of them. I want to just make a couple of comments that came up in our report to you earlier on suggestions to the next commission. One of the things we discovered was that we really needed to have a facilitator from the beginning. Once we got a facilitator to work with us, we really, it really moved along better and we really started to focus in. We also created subcommittees for some of the topics and split some of the work and then ask those commissioners to come back to us. We think that's a good thing to continue to. And the one thing that we didn't do, but that we think probably should be done is set sort of a length of time you wanna spend on this. How long do you wanna deliberate over these changes? And our suggestion would be, it'd be best to be able to report back to the council between nine and maybe 12 months, not a year and a half later which is what it was for us. The one other thing I'd like to say is that we were served by excellent county employees. They did a fabulous job and they did enormous amounts of research, but they were always ready to go. They always got us started on time. We tried to finish on time and considering we had many, many two and three hour meetings and had to have set up for all the electronic things that we needed and the research papers, I really compliment the staff that you loaned to the commission to get us through this process. Thank you. Co Chair Miller, you're very welcome. Um, and Councilmember Dombowski and I can personally vouch for the time um, you and all the, all the other people on the commission invested because our Harborview leadership group was meeting on the same floor on the same night um, pretty regularly through that entire year. So we were coming and going from the building at the same time you were coming and going and know the work you were investing. Um, at, let me, by way of further introduction, point out that um, Co-Chair Miller has spoken of 11 amendments. At this point in time, there are five introduced and two on today's um, COW agenda. Know that the other three will be scheduled um, and we'll continue our work from there. But just in time management, um, you're already aware that this meeting is now 328 um, and we have the two ahead of us and two motions. Um, but know that the others will be scheduled. It was a matter of time management that, that set that up. And I have a question for um, Co-Chair Miller, um, Council Member Von Reichbauer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Louise, thank you very much for your service and thank Ron as well. I have a question relative to the Sheriff's position. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. You mentioned that the under the proposal that the County Executive would nominate and the county council would confirm. When I was in the state Senate, I chaired the confirmation process. And it was a very interesting process because one of the um, misjudgments by members of the state Senate was a person could serve um, uh, whether, regardless of whether or not they were confirmed by the state Senate. Does this allow an appointee to serve prior to or has to wait for confirmation by the county council? <laughs> Boy, I wish I could tell you that. Uh, perhaps one of the staff members there has this in their mind. I don't. I think that the council has to confirm before they can serve, but that's a maybe. So if I can jump in, uh, Council Member, uh, the appointment process, the, the amendment that it was brought forward by the Charter Review Commission would effectively re revert the appointment of the sheriff to the same process followed by all of the other department heads. And there are allowances for short durations of time. And I just don't know off the top of my head if it's 60 or 90 days and there can be continuances of those interim appointments until that confirmation occurs. 
uh, we can uh, check with the uh, legal counsel to advise the Charter Review Commission and get back to you on that. But I do believe that it would just be the same process followed for appointment of all of the other department heads. And so there is a period of time where they can serve before having been uh, confirmed. Mr. Chair, if I may continue, I would like to see a definitive answer. I appreciate Patrick's comment, but um, I'd like to have a definitive answer. Um, Louise, uh, thank you again. You and I were part of a process by which we did put the uh, process of uh, election of the sheriff out to the public. Um, I thought then it was, it increased accountability. I believe that we've had a number of very good sheriffs in the process, and I continue to believe that accountability starts with the public, not with politicians. Thank you. I concur. Further questions of Co-Chair Miller. Um, and I, let me interject and ask, um, Mr. S is it Seca and Ms. Treas, are you presenting on the overall recommendations or on the first um, charter amendment itself? Um, I'd be presenting on Olio and Rob will be presenting on inquest. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I will continue taking questions for Co-Chair Miller if there are any on the overall presentation before we get to the individual um, amendments. Balducci. Council Member Balducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm not sure who this question is for, and it's partially historical, partially a judgment question. Um, these uh, charter amendments can only be on a November ballot. November ballots, especially in a presidential year like this year, are extremely long. And, um, and I think that we had all more or less uh, can, can coalesced around the idea that we wouldn't try to put all of the 11 on one ballot, even if, even if everybody agreed uh, to all of them. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, is the, does anybody, staff or uh, Chair Miller, recall past versions of updates to the charter? I recall voting on them. And sometimes there were quite a few. Um, I'm just trying to wrap my brain around what's the right number or what's too many, I think is probably the more important thing because uh, and let me just say, uh, we we proposed out of my office the one about the about the um, uh, gosh, you know, uh, the in initiatives to to the to the council and to the and to the public, because um, we had a group of people try to run an initiative, and regardless of what you thought about the substance of it, the process was not good, and it it really created a lot of uh, concern and disillusionment in the public because they did what they thought they needed to do on the timelines they thought they needed to do it only to find they were too late. And so we've updated our ordinances and, and other uh, procedures internal to King County. And now we need this charter change to fix it. But uh, if it was, if you were to ask me, is it the most important thing, uh, the most time sensitive thing, it probably isn't. So I'm just trying to wrap my brain around the question of how many makes sense uh, at a time. Yeah, and I and I believe we felt the same way, which is why our report said, you know, we know you might not be able to put them all on the same ballot. Mm -hmm. um, but that was one of the reasons that we took some of the early, if you remember, we had an early report that yep. we put in that had some of the things that we thought were less controversial and maybe uh, could be put on the ballot in 2019. <laughs> um, and it didn't happen. So that's, and you know, that's up to the council, lots of things going on, but that's why we're now faced with, oh, we either have to do them all uh, here in a, a really busy year, that's very true, or we'll have to pick and choose what we think we really need to get changed now. And you've raised one issue. We, it was complicated to look at the length of time people had to get signatures and what they had, yeah, right. And what kind of paper it had to be on and, and, on, and on and on. There were a lot of things that seemed like they weren't necessary, but that you still have to work with your election departments and they still have to have the time to be able to actually get things out in the voters pamphlet, et cetera. So yep. anyway, that was one of the reasons that we gave you sort of our early report with the, a gentle suggestion that you might want to put it on the 19, 2019. Are you suggesting though that the committee thought that 11 would be a number that you could do on one ballot? Uh, I don't know that we had that direct conversation. I think some people 
thought, well, maybe, but uh, we didn't, for a while, there were a couple that we didn't think were going to be considered. But after we had worked through language and then had public hearings and heard from people, we thought, well, you know, maybe we need to sit back and say, do we go ahead with this or not? And so we realized that 11 is quite a bit. And some of them are easier for people to understand than others. Well, thank you. And thank you for the uh you're uh, being a go-to person, Councilmember Miller. <laughs> we, uh, we always appreciate your advice and considered work on so many big issues at King County. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Co-Chair Miller? Seeing none, we um, thank you very much. And we will take up the first of the two um, charter amendments that are on our agenda today. This is proposed ordinance 2020-206, which would amend the county charter to grant the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight subpoena powers. Nick Bowman will give a staff report on the proposal. Um, Mr. Bowman, the line is yours. Good afternoon, council members. Uh, for the record, Nick Bowman, council central staff. Uh, the materials for this item begin on page 389 of your packet. Proposed ordinance 2020-0206 would submit to the voters of King County an amendment to the county charter to be placed on the next general election, which would add the authority to subpoena documents, witnesses, and other relevant evidence to the list of charter powers granted to the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight. As the council is well aware, King County has worked for many years to improve oversight of the King County Sheriff's Office. In the interest of time, I won't go into the full background of those efforts, but I will say that they began in 2006 with the establishment of a blue ribbon panel on police oversight and the adoption of ordinance 15611 creating OLEO. In November 2015, the voters of King County approved an amendment to the county charter that established OLEO as a charter mandated county office within the legislative branch. This amendment, now section 265 of the King County Charter, increased oversight responsibilities for OLEO and required that those authorities be established by ordinance. Uh, and in April 2017, the council adopted ordinance 18500, expanding OLEO's authorities to include investigative authority with subpoena powers for the office, complaint and concern intake responsibilities, including the authority to review KCSO complaint intake classifications, authorization to review policies, procedures, training, and operations, and to make recommendations, uh, access to relevant information and crime scene authorities, notification requirements regarding KCSO complaint handling processes and review of inquest findings. Uh, proposed ordinance 2020-0206, as I said, would submit to the voters an amendment, of the King County amendment to the King County Charter, which would add the authority to subpoena witnesses, documents, and other evidence relating to its investigations or review to the list of OLEO powers described in section 265 of the County Charter. As stated earlier, OLEO has subpoena powers under King County Code 2.75.055. However, unlike a charter provision that can only be added or removed by a vote of the people, law established by ordinance is transitory and can be changed by the council adopting a new ordinance. If the subpoena power were added to the charter, it can only be removed by a vote of the people. According to OLEO Director uh, Deborah Jacobs, without the ability to compel the Sheriff's Office personnel to be interviewed and to produce relevant records, OLEO has limited ability to complete thorough and objective investigations. Uh, now, the authority to issue subpoenas is an established power within oversight agencies around the country and uh, one granted to numerous county entities. A non-exhaustive list of oversight offices in other jurisdictions across the country with some form of subpoena powers can be found on page 391 of your packet and includes Oakland, California, Washington, D.C., Chicago, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, Indianapolis, Indiana, Detroit, Michigan, Los Angeles, California, New York City, Cambridge, Massachusetts, and Rochester, New York. Uh, the table on page 392 of your packet lists the county entities with the authority to issue subpoenas, as well as any limitations to that authority. And some of these entities include the county council, the ombuds office, the office of civil rights, the auditor, the chief medical examiner, the personnel board, and the hearing examiner. Uh, it should be noted that should the proposed ordinance be adopted and subsequently approved by the voters, the amendment passage alone may not be enough to effectuate the desired change. As the proposed amendment may affect the working conditions of KCSO's unionized workforce, the county would most likely need to engage in bargaining with the affected unions before OLEO could exercise the powers granted by that amendment. 
Um, I also just want to touch briefly on some election timing requirements. Uh, in order to place this on the November 3rd, 2020 ballot, an effective ordinance must be transmitted to elections department by August 4th, 2020. Uh, therefore, the last regular council meeting date for adoption is July 21st. And uh, August 4th, 2020 is the last special council meeting uh, date to adopt the ordinance as an emergency. Uh, finally, there are two amendments. Amendment one would make changes to the language and substance of the proposed charter amendment, including changing the general election date in which the proposed charter amendment would appear on the ballot from November 2019 to November 2020. Granting OLEO the authority to administer oaths to witnesses subpoenaed by OLEO and clarifying that any witness subpoenaed by OLEO shall have the right to be represented by legal counsel. Uh, amendment T1 conforms the title of the proposed ordinance to the changes made by Amendment 1 with regards to changing the general election date in which the proposed charter amendment would appear on the ballot from 2019 to 20, uh, November 2020. Uh, that concludes my staff report. We have uh, OLEO Director Deborah Jacobs and Chief Patty Coltindle from KCSO on the line uh, to help answer any questions the committee may have. Mr. Bowman, for my clar clarity, the two amendments are the one substantive amendment and the title amendment, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, and next I'd like to call on Alejandro Trace, um, Commissioner from the Charter Review Commission, who I believe is um, prepared to present on this amendment. Alejandra? Pausing Alejandra Trace. There we go. Hi, everyone. Hi. Um, thanks, Councilmember McDermott. First of all, I'll say that it says that uh, my internet is a bit unstable here in rural unincorporated, which I think all of us feel a little unstable during COVID. So um, let me know if I'm lagging and I can try to adjust or shut off my um, video. I wanted to um, thank you, uh, Council Member German Chair and all the council members for this discussion. I also want to express my gratefulness to the Charter Commission, some of it who are watching, especially to- Oh, Hunter, you just Chair. locked up. Uh, Oh, Hundra, I'd, 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 I'd suggest you turn your video off. Okay, will do. Is this there any better? Go. Yes. Okay, excellent. So just wanted to say thanks again to uh, the Charter Commission, especially the Equity uh, Committee, especially my co-chair, Liz Ford, who was a main driver. Um, I think Nick actually mentioned quite a number of things. So I don't know that um, I'm going to be doing a lot more of fleshing that out, but I did just want to say a little bit from the Charter Commission's perspective as to um, what we felt that this amendment would do and also why we felt it was necessary. Um, as Nick mentioned, this um, OLEO needs to have the authority to subpoena records and provide effective civilian oversight for of law enforcement. Um, and of course, the amendment for subpoena power would add to that list of OLEO, um, of authorities charted, uh, granted to OLEO in the charter and the county code already has a reflection and contemplates granting this authority to OLEO, but it is not listed as in the charter as it is with other agencies. Uh, now the CRC believes this amendment, if this amendment passes and ultimately can be bargained, the subpoenas will rarely be used as parties will share information and not want to have to use the subpoena process. Well, with that in mind, why do we feel this is necessary? The Charter Commission believes that the residents of King County have expected civilian oversight of the King County Sheriff's Office since 2006 and before, but at least 2006 when the council created the office, and certainly since 2015 when the voters added OLEO to the county charter. Uh, however, efforts for effective civilian oversights, including subpoena power, have consistently been thwarted by the collective bargaining process. The issues to this day the Charter Commission believes um, continues to this day, and we feel it's a powerful statement to add the subpoena power to the Charter and make it consistent with other agencies. It's been almost 14 years since the Council first created OLEO, and that wait is long enough for effective civilian oversight. We feel by you moving this forward to the ballot, voter approval will help clarify the public's desire for empowered oversight of our Sheriff's Office. Thank you. Thank you. Um, council members, questions of Mr. Bowman, Ms. Trace, and um, um, Patty Cole Tindall. I'm sorry, Ms. Cole Tindall, I don't know your current title. 
Under sheriff? Uh, in another week, I'll be the under sheriff. Um, currently, only, he's still chief, but. Okay. And Olio Director um, Jacobs are all available for questions as well. Colleagues? Question, Lambert. Councilmember Lambert. Thank you. So I have two questions. One is, will this change the requirement for it to be bargained? And secondly, um, and if you look at the chart, there are many um, departments that have the ability to subpoena, including us. Um, to my knowledge, we have never used it. So how often in all of those has it ever been used? To my knowledge, it hasn't been. So I would like to be updated on that. Um, I can speak generally to the first question, which is that uh, it, it may require bargaining. My, it is our understanding that yes, bargaining would need to uh, take place before the, uh, the OLEO to actually be able to subpoena KCSO personnel. Um, that, but that of course, uh, you know, we would have to actually have uh, it, the, the member would have to be adopted by the voters. So that's, I, I don't want to put the cart before the horse too much. Right. And then the that's second it. question, I do not have uh, on hand a record of how many times uh, county entities have issued subpoenas. Um, I, I, I would be, I have to query all of those offices to, to, to determine that. It should be pretty easy because I think the answer will probably be zero. Um, I don't understand what is different. We already have the ability for them to subpoena. And as she said, it's been years that it hasn't been bargained for a variety of reasons that we probably should get to the bottom of. Um, but this, this doesn't change. It will be back exactly where we are right now in my mind. So that's a concern that we're making a pretty much false assumption to the public that this will change um, the underlying. <clears throat> Thank you. Director Jacobs, did you have a response either to the previous question or the current one? Yes, thank you. I appreciate you hearing from me. A couple contextual comments. Um, so the offices in the county that have subpoena power are council, ob ombuds, office of civil rights, auditor, chief medical examiner, personnel board, and hearing examiner. And I also want to let folks know that it's a pretty much a norm for investigatory um, oversight agencies to have subpoena power. And I have a list of about 15 or 20 that I'm aware of that have it. Um, in fact, almost none of them use it. And there's a good reason why. The reason is, is that once they have it, the threat of using it suffices to get the access to information that they need. That's been the lesson I've learned from hearing from my nationwide colleagues is that once you have it, it's sort of, um, works without having to assert it, but council member Lambert's comments are still well taken. Um, the other thing I did wanna mention is that there's specifically a reopener in the current collective bargaining agreement. Um, it says that, um, that if the um, charter is amended, then it's a reopener for bargaining subpoena power as required by law. Um, so that's one reason to do it now, because um, I know we have a lot of ambitions for the next round of bargaining. I also feel like having the voters affirm that this is their desire and make it consistent with the council's understanding of the role and the investigation role will be very important. And I think that affirmation would be meaningful and even potentially meaningful if there are challenges in the context of bargaining. So um, no, it's definitely does not overcome the state law challenges presented by um, collective bargaining for, for oversight, but I still think it's a important and worthy thing to be in the charter to speak the will of the county. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions, colleagues? Done. Council member Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chair, appreciate that. And I, this is a question for I have two questions. One is, does the sheriff's office have a position on this particular charter amendment? If so I appreciate you articulating it. And then the, uh, the other question I have is, and maybe Deborah can answer, there are different kinds of subpoenas in the world. Um, they're civil, they're criminal, there are legislative subpoenas. What is the, um, 
what is the type of subpoena we are talking about here? And is there any standard um, that has to be met in order to request the subpoena? Uh, in other words, does it have to be within the scope of an active investigation, or can it be very broadly used in terms of uh, various policies? What is what does the, the Charter Amendment speak to uh, with specificity? Thank you. So uh, I can, Chief Cole Tyndall, Sheriff's Office, I can answer Councilmember Dunn's question. So the position of the sheriff and our office is that we really are not taking a position on this. Um, obviously, this is something that um, has been an issue if it goes to the voters, um, becomes part of the charter. It does have to be bargained. At least that's my perspective as your previous uh, director of labor relations responsible for collective bargaining in the county. Um, and that currently it is the executive who has that responsibility to negotiate um, this, which is really a working condition, but because the voters previously um, basically approved that, uh, you know, we would not bargain our own working conditions, which makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. And on the second floor. So I don't have a full answer to your question. What I can tell you is the intent is that it would be able to have um, compel people, personnel to um, uh, be interviewed about incidents and also to compel to get banking or phone records. As far as the legal complexities of sort of how it would be administered, I don't have the film familiarity and would have to have some research done on that. Can I just make one yeah. statement? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I, I, I want to ask, I think that uh, like some other issues, I, I need some legal clarity on it. It may be just that it's substantially similar, as you said, to other independent council appointed positions, but I, I'd like to know, um, and particularly, I'm interested in the in the contours, or in other words, the limitations of what that subpoena power uh, provides for my own information. At some point, thanks. I mean, we're gonna, I think, take action to cavil. We still have to pass forth for council, so appreciate that. And go ahead. I just wanted to clarify one other thing about a reopener that Deborah mentioned. That still has to be uh, something that the guild would be interested in doing. While it's in the contract. It still requires that there is the willingness to reopen. So um, I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Can I mention one other thing, Council Member. Um, Council Member Dunn, you know, the questions you're asking also would relate to what kind of independent investigations are being conducted. And this is something I'm really eager for Council to give some thought to and hopefully have a stakeholders conversation that includes guild members and KCSO and the public, there are different ways it could be approached. Um, and I won't go into details now because I know we're short on time, but I think that factors a lot into sort of what this might look like. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And, and I'll just finish with this. And so I'm not like, you guys aren't like searching in the dark for what I'm looking for is that the subpoena power is rationally related to the charter um, the mission of Olio in the charter and other subsequent um, motions and legislation we put forward, as well as staffing, that it um, that it if it passed forward, that it it move in a way that is uh, directly related to that mission, as opposed to some you know blanket authority to subpoena whatever it is that is desired for the purpose of driving some policies or set of policies for that's a little bit different and it just needs to be discussed so we know what we're we're buying here so to speak up the grove council member up the grove thank you mr chair i think i know the answer to this but i want to make sure is the uh, sheriff's guild contract next up for renewal at the end of next year is that correct yes. some heads nodding uh, this charter amendment wouldn't take effect, you know, be November ballot, take effect, I assume, January 1. And I imagine that timing would be just about right to begin going into 
negotiations and uh right so it, perfect timing so that speaks to me as one reason to act and and just one comment if i might if that's appropriate mr chair that i my constituents or people I hear from are often very confused about this process. And it's frustrating as elected official because the heat's on us. Um, I don't think most people realize that the only tools of civilian oversight that we're able to conduct over our uh, sheriff's department are those in which the police agree to. Um, because of this provision in state law, that allows not only for the police guild to negotiate, but if we don't reach agreement, it goes to a third party and that decision's final. And when that third party often looks at comparables, it means it's a barrier to change. And so this, just to be clear about communicating what we're doing, we're, you know, this is being proposed to go in front of the voters, be put into our county constitution, our county charter to strengthen our position there whether legally, politically, uh, structurally. But at the end of the day, the only oversight we're allowed to provide is that in which the police agree to let us provide um, until if and when state law were to change. Uh, and so not to get people's hopes up too much um, who are advocating for this, because unless, again, unless that state law changes, this is going to be only if the police want us to, basically. So that's my my comment on it, but I, I'm very supportive of moving forward. Colleagues? Verification? Yes, member Lambert. So um, could you clarify, I didn't think that, you, that the OVO office had the right to do independent investigations. And I thought that there was a grievance at some point about that. Can you tell me where the grievance landed and, and is there the right to do independent investigations? So I can say on, the, on the, the history that there was a grievance filed after the ordinance was initially passed in 2006. Um, the, uh, most of that uh, ordinance was repealed and then the grievance was uh, uh, dropped. Uh, and then another ordinance was passed in 2008 that aligned with the uh, contract, uh, the guild's contract at the time. Um, and then the powers were later established. Uh, I'll, I'll let Deborah speak it to the individual or the independent investigations, but that the the initial grievance was for the initial ordinance, and then another ordinance was put in its place. Um, so. I, you're talking about the more current um, grievance. The grievance was over a systemic review of the shooting of my chance Dunlop Gittins and the guild has been on hold with its grievance because it wants to present it to OLR in person. And because of the virus that has not happened. Um, the reason I do not believe that report is an investigation is because no investigation was done, meaning no one was called. It was just the review of the file, much like you know, auditing and then adding expertise. So if they don't like that, they're really not gonna like what an investigation is. <laughs> and that's something that, as I mentioned earlier, we really need to discuss, but that's a status after it's presented to OLR, OLR rules, and then um, it's possible it could be appealed to arbitration. That would be the next step. I would love for us to be able to resolve it peacefully before that myself, and I've expressed that to OLR. So at this very moment, do you have the right to do I'm sorry, the right to what? Do independent investigations. So on a very limited scope, for example, it would be possible under limited circumstances to investigate someone who is not represented by the guild. Uh, yes, yeah, so basically, Deborah's correct. That would mean the chiefs, the undersheriff, um, perhaps our legal advisors, those that are, you know, I think there's seven or eight of us that are not represented. So very limited. And beyond that, Patty, I believe the scope is also limited, meaning you it might have to be a use of force or something like that as well. I'd have to look at the language, but I think it's along those lines.
Thank you. Councilmember Council Member Dimbowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, we've uh, had some discussion about this, and, and I want to remind folks, and please, uh, Deborah or Nick or legal counsel, correct me if I'm wrong, but Nick mentioned the 2017 implementing ordinance that I had worked on with uh, council, then Council Member Gossett, which uh, carried, that brought to life the, the charter amendments passed by the voters. And we, I believe, already adopted in that ordinance the authority for the Office of Law Enforcement Oversight to issue subpoenas. So the, 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 it's in their uh, charge today, um, and I don't, I don't, that hasn't really been mentioned, or if it has, it's maybe gotten lost a little bit, that this charter amendment would basically, the, the thinking behind putting in the charter is that it, it elevates the importance, and to the extent we don't get um, agreement from the guild at the bargaining table, Councilman Reptogrove is 100% right, and I like the way he phrased it, that we can only do the uh, oversight that the Guild lets us do, um, uh, but the thinking is that perhaps with the voters speaking on this particular topic, that it might, if necessary, uh, to go to an arbitrator, have some extra um, strength in terms of the uh, the people speaking. So the the power is there by ordinance. This just puts it in the charter. We're not changing the contours of it at all in terms of the kind of subpoena power, and I think. With respect to the individual investigations, the investigations of individuals, say, use of force uh, versus other um, investigations by the office, the subpoena power could be helpful in their systemic review as well, to the extent they need documents to complete that. And maybe that's my question to Director Jacobs. Would, would you agree with that? Um, I would say at this point, um, we are fairly successful in getting the documents we need from the sheriff's office. They have capacity problems, so there's a timeliness issue, but um, besides that, like we have that kind of access. So it would be hard for me to envision that systemic review. We, I guess we would have to be trying to get data from like outside sources. Mm -hmm. um, it's possible, but I'll have to think a little bit more on that and I'll let you know. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Colleagues, anything else? Would you like a motion? I'd welcome a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be happy to move adoption of proposed ordinance number 2020-0206, which would, um, with a due pass recommendation to the full council, the ordinance would put before the voters in the November 2020 election the question of whether they would like to amend the King County Charter to specifically grant the uh, Office of Law Enforcement Oversight, which was created by Charter, uh, the power to issue subpoenas, and if amended here by Amendment 1, to compel witnesses to testify with the assistance if they wish of counsel. Councilmember Dombowski has moved to move that we give a due pass recommendation to ordinance 2020-206. Um, Council Member Dombowski, do you want to move adoption of the amendment? So moved. Can, amendment um, one is before us. Um, staff address the amendment. Is there um, discussion on the amendment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Nay. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Move T1. Um, T1 is before us. Um, discussion. Uh, all those in favor of T1, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Title amendment is adopted. We have ordinance 2020-206 as amended before us. Um, discussion. Mr. Chair, I'd like to speak. Councilmember Dimbaus, uh, Balducci, thank you. Thank you. It's been a while since somebody did that. <laughs> um, uh, I, I didn't speak up during the, the question and answer, but I wanted to just make my feelings on this uh, clear. Um, it, 
I have always believed as somebody who has spent a lot of time working with internal investigations people as a labor advisor, as a legal advisor, as a director, um, I have always believed that uh, good oversight, oversight that is um, accepted by all sides, by the public, uh, by the people who have been harmed in most situations where we're doing an investigation, somebody's been harmed somehow, and by the people who are providing critical services like law enforcement, uh, feeling that they get a fair shake. I think that public oversight provides that kind of assurance to everyone when it's done right. But in order for it to be done right, the investigators need access to the information they need to, to do their job. Uh, without full information, they cannot provide uh, the transparency that's what we seek with oversight. And so I think this is almost, almost a no-brainer. Um, I don't have any concerns with this uh, level of, of, of authority at all. I, I hope that we can implement it. Um, I personally also believe that uh, oversight should not be subject to bargaining. I should not be able to say whether somebody what somebody, how somebody judges me. I should not control that process for myself. Uh, that's just, that's almost unethical. And so I think it's really important that we move in this direction uh, for everybody. By the way, I'm very much in favor of having a process that was uh, briefed to us in the earlier briefing about how elected officials can be hold, held accountable. I'm not holding it on myself or my colleagues separate from this. So um, I just feel very strongly this is a good step uh, I will vote for it. I hope that it, it passes in November and uh, that we can find a way to implement it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Other colleagues? Councilmember Dimbowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I know the meeting's running long and I, I'll try and be very brief here, but uh, I echo the comments of Councilmember Balducci. And uh, uh, I've been thinking a lot lately about the phrase law enforcement. Uh, and there's two pieces to that, the laws and the enforcement. And I think in the debate we're having here in our country right now, we should look at what laws we are passing and have passed and determine whether they are laws that uh, have disparate impacts in the way um, they come down on folks and make changes. We also need to look at our enforcement side and make sure that it's just and fair and effective uh, and that people have confidence in it. This is one small piece of building confidence in the enforcement side of the laws uh, that we as politicians and others have adopted. And uh, like any profession, I just think that independent oversight, checks and balances, if you will, on that is uh, par for the course. And it not only uh, builds confidence by, uh, in, in the system by the public, or at least it can if it's done well, but it can also improve the organization. This is not about getting somebody or going after somebody. This is about ensuring um, that there is transparency when something uh, it goes wrong uh, and that there is accountability and that there can also be vindication and clearance, right? Let's, let's keep in mind that these outcomes are not predetermined. We have independence in, in this structure to take a look at things when there's been a complaint made and make sure that when the decision is rendered, uh, that it comes from not an internal investigation unit or somebody, uh, a part of the organization, but rather somebody outside. It's why our courts are independent. It's why the judge wears a black robe to signify neutrality. Um, this is, these are values enshrined in our, in, our, in our country. And this today is just a tool for our independent oversight office to be able to hopefully carry out that mission. I want to just signal to colleagues, we've had a good discussion today about uh, the role that the labor negotiations plays in this. And I've heard some new statements, including one echoing our county executive's leadership saying, hey, you know, but for state law, we, we wouldn't and maybe shouldn't have to negotiate this. Um, we set the labor policy today for the county as the county council. And, and I think that um, we shouldn't wait on this issue and also on the ability of Olio to conduct independent investigations until the next bargaining cycle. I know a lot has happened since we adopted that contract a couple of months ago, and I, I wanna just 
let you all know that we're working on a draft labor policy that would ask the executive to go back to the bargaining table and see if the guild is willing to reopen uh, the contract on those two items and get it done. Um, because it, I just don't think you can watch what's occurred here in America and have the same answer that they've had for a decade, which is no. And if it is no, I think that tells us um, some valuable information about what policy responses and what budget steps we might need to take. Because as I said at the last meeting, we talked about this on Friday, uh, I think our public wants us to fund a law, a law enforcement system that protects and serves in a fair and just way. Um, and effective oversight and transparency is a part of a, a critical part of that and is necessary, in my view, uh, before uh, significant funds are put in. So um, I think that Councilman Balducci got it right. This is like almost a no brainer. <laughs> We've already done it in the ordinance. This enshrines it if the voters approve it in our county constitution and encourage colleagues' support. Appreciate the co-sponsors uh, that have come on, Councilmember Zahalai, Cole Wells, and McDermott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the discussion, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Balducci? Aye. Councilmember Balducci votes aye. Councilmember Dembowski? Aye. Councilmember Dembowski votes aye. Councilmember Aye. Councilmember Dunn votes aye. Councilmember Cole Wells? Aye. Councilmember Cole Wells votes aye. Councilmember Lambert? No. Councilmember Lambert votes no. Councilmember Uptegro? Aye. Councilmember Uptegro votes aye. Councilmember Von Reichbauer? Aye. Councilmember Von Reichbauer votes aye. Councilmember Zahalai? Aye. Councilmember Zahalai votes aye. Mr. Chair? Aye. Mr. Chair, the vote is eight ayes. Councilmember Lambert, no. By your vote, we've given a due pass recommendation to Ordinance 2020 206. And um, we will. Um, Staff, is this the one that um, time to engross might be needed? Um, yes, I think it's possible, but it's it's also if if there's a desire to expedite, that would be fine as well. Is there a desire to expedite? We're, then I will. We will not expedite. It will be on regular course of action to full council, um, and not on consent. Um, that takes us to item nine. Proposed ordinance 2019 to um, 36, which would amend the county charter to clarify when an inquest was being held and to provide for legal representation for the family of the decedent. Um, I know my colleagues are aware of litigation surrounding the inquest process. I want to put out point out that the litigation is separate from the charter amendment we'll be discussing, and it's my hope that we'll be able. We will focus on the charter amendment, not discuss the litigation issues, which would, necess would necessitate an executive session. Jenny Jim John Batista will give a staff report on the proposed charter amendment. Um, Ms. John Batista, the line is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jenny Gian Batista, Council staff. Agenda item nine begins on page 403 of your packet. As you noted, Mr. Chair, this is a charter amendment related to inquest, and it would add language to the charter about when an inquest is to occur, and it requires the county to assign an attorney to represent the family of the decedent in the inquest proceeding. In the interest of time, I will be covering highlights in each section of my staff report. I'd like to start with a few background facts on inquests on page 404 of the packet. An inquest is an administrative fact-finding inquiry into and the review of the manner, facts, and circumstances of the death of an individual. In King County, inquests are held when a death involves a member of any law enforcement agency within King County while in the performance of his or her duties. The scope of the inquest is limited to the cause and circumstances of the death, including whether the law enforcement member acted pursuant to policy and training. The purpose of the inquest is not to find fault 
or determine whether the use of force was justified. An inquest is not a trial in the sense that there's no judgment on liability or fault or uh, fault is produced. However, an inquest has some of the attributes of a trial, including hearing sworn testimony of witnesses and a selection of a, a jury, in the case of an inquest known as a panel, as the finders of fact. As you uh, are well aware, uh, there have been recent changes to the inquest process in recent years. I wanted to highlight a few of those changes on page 405 and 406 of the packet. In December of 2017, the executive convened a six-member King County Inquest Process Review Committee. Then in January of 2018, the executive temporarily halted all King County inquests in order to allow more time to review the existing inquest policies and procedures. In October of 2018, based on some of the review panel recommendations, the executive signed a revised executive order for the policies and procedures for the inquest. And then in May 2019, under the new inquest process, Judge Michael Spearman was appointed as an inquest administrator. There was a pause again in the inquest process in, De in December uh, 2020, as the parties indicated that they intended to seek review of the inquest procedures in King County Superior Court. Petitions were filed with the King County Superior Court uh, subsequent to, to that. Uh, most recently, uh, on Friday, June 11th, the executive uh, signed a revised executive order, uh, which includes revised policies and procedures. However, of note, uh, there were really two uh, things that were revised uh, substantive changes uh, to now allow for subpoenas uh, to be issued to involved officers and to allow counsel for the involved officers to participate in the inquest hearings, regardless of whether they offer testimony. The next uh, date that's coming up is July 17th of 2020. That is when Superior Court is scheduled to address all of the pending petitions related to the inquest process. I want to note that it's my understanding that the outcome of the litigation won't affect implementation of the Charter Amendment if it's approved by the voters. Page 405 of the packet provides a very high level summary of the current inquest process uh, that is uh, outlined in the executive order. The process starts with the prosecuting attorney's office receiving information from a law enforcement agency within King County of a death of an individual involving law, uh, law enforcement. The PAO then reviews that information and advises the executive as to whether there should be an inquest. Upon receiving the PAO's advisory opinion, the executive determines whether to hold an inquest. If the inquest is to be held, the executive then directs the manager to proceed with the inquest, and the manager then assigns one of the inquest administrators to preside over the inquest and the Superior Court provides the facilities, the jurors, and the courtroom staff. Specifically now looking at the language in the Charter Amendment, um, please turn to page 406 and 407 of the packet. The proposed changes to the Charter, if adopted by voters, include several substantive changes to section 895 of the Charter. Specifically, it adds additional language regarding when an inquest is to be uh, conducted. This additional language specifies that an inquest shall be held where a member of any law enforcement agency's actions, decision, or possible failure to offer the appropriate care may have contributed to an individual's death. With this language, the intent of the Charter Review Commission was to expand and broaden uh, the number and circumstances under which the inquests are to occur. The next substantive change uh, in the Charter Amendment uh, is that it defines what a member of any law enforcement agency is for purposes of this section of the Charter. Uh, and, and that uh, is the second substantive change. The third one is that it requires the county to assign an attorney to represent the family of the decedent decedent in the inquest proceeding, but the family has the option of accepting the attorney or not. 
As council members are aware, in January of 2018, the council did adopt ordinance 18652, which requires the Department of Public Defense to provide legal representation to the family, participating in inquests regardless of the income level of the family. The proposed charter amendment is very similar to this language. Mr. Chair, I would note that there are two amendments in your separate amendment packet uh, starting on page seven. These amendments are not substantive. The first amendment, which is on uh, page seven, and it also has a corresponding title amendment, reflects suggestions by legal counsel so that all the charter amendments use the same language uh, when referring to the election dates. The second amendment on page nine is really a style and readability change uh, so that the sentence reads a little bit better. Uh, Mr. Chair, that concludes uh, my comments. I'm happy to answer any questions for you. Thank you, Ms. John Batista. Before we go to questions, I would call on Mr. Seca to take to present. Commissioner from the Charter Review Commission. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Council members. My name is Rob Saka, and okay. I'm a commissioner. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Great. And I'm a commissioner on the Charter Review Commission. It is my honor to appear before you all today, and especially Council Member Zahale. Tommy Lee. Jesus Hernandez Murillo. Joseph Pepin. My Chance. Dunlop Giddens, Charlena Lyles. These are just a few of the people that we're, when we talk about inquests, irrespective of whether the death is, is deemed to be justified or not, we must never forget to acknowledge the humanity and the names of those killed in encounters with police. Sadly, the lives families and communities are forever changed when someone is killed by police. Nationally, we're also mindful of the recent brutal killings by law enforcement of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others across the country. And I'll tell you that in my personal capacity over the last few weeks, I've been absolutely honored to march alongside my, my dear friend and old colleague, Council Member Zahalai as well as thousands of others in the movement for black lives across our region and our nation. Personally, I've also been moved by Germay's devotion to serving others and humbled by his presence and inspired by his bold leadership. And I thank him and I thank every one of the council members who have supported this particular proposal to date. I'm also hopeful that our region our region's unified voice will bring meaningful, lasting policy change to address issues of police accountability and transparency. But in this forum, in this legislative body, in which I virtually stand before you today, we must move from protest to policy. And here is the opportunity at hand. So when we're talking about the proposed charter amendment, what will it specifically accomplish? Well, on the commission, we believe that this common sense charter amendment recommendation before this committee would directly advance three basic ideals in law enforcement, accountability, truth, and transparency. Therefore, the commission recommends making two substantive changes, which Jenny already highlighted uh, as it pertains to inquests. To recap, we wanna do, we wanna elevate to the charter, the relevant county code provision providing a county funded attorney to families of the deceased during the inquest process. Again, this particular proposal, with respect to this particular proposal, it's 100% consistent with existing law and interpretation. The second thing that we wanna do, as Jenny alluded to, is we wanna ensure that the inquest process occurs in the event of an in-custody death. She, she talked about some of the, the textual underpinnings and some of the specifics as it relates to the exact language. But broadly, what we want to do is make sure it applies to law enforcement agencies and corrections agencies and require an inquest at any time that any action or decision or failure to act may have contributed to a death. We talked about what an inquest is. There, there's some egregious myths out there we, we've heard from the community 
um, during this process, but the overwhelming uh, majority of, of community input that we've heard and gathered during this process was, was strongly in favor of having the inquest as we, we propose today. It's just the administrative fact-finding inquiry. The purpose is not to determine liability or fault. It doesn't address wrongdoing or whether the death could have been avoided or, or whether it was justified. So why do we, why do, why are we moving this specific proposed charter, charter amendment before you today? Well, broadly, when we began our work on the commission to help enhance the inquest process, potentially at the charter level, we started with the premise that aggrieved families deserve answers. They deserve truth as well. Again, inquests are not a finger pointing exercise to assign blame one way or the other. The findings of an inquest help all stakeholders, including policymakers, including you all, help you understand the causes and circumstances of the death to enable people to learn and grow from these experiences. We've we found that inquest reform at the charter level helps maintain and improve public confidence and trust in the integrity and professionalism of the community's various law enforcement agencies across King County during officer-involved killings. Again, the goal is to enable departments to be held accountable for creating better, safer, and more equitable ways of protecting and, and policing. So we know that it adds legal representation and affirmative right to legal re representation for family members of the deceased. And we think that this will fully and more equitably allow participation in the, equi in the inquest process, regardless of a family's financial means. And we also learned that providing legal counsel for all families of the deceased will better ensure each party to an inquest will have equal opportunity to participate. Again, that one is 100% consistent with existing law, but we felt strongly that as a matter of policy and priority before the current crisis that we're seeing, and I'm not talking about the COVID crisis, that it was important to up-level that particular provision to the charter. And then with respect to the in-custody death clarification, the commission wanted to shine a light the light of transparency that's inherent with the more robust inquest by expanding the requirement to all in-custody death situations. And we felt that understanding in-custody deaths, learning from each other's deaths, and using that information to make posit positive changes to the system outweighed any potential concern or, or cost of having too many inquests. Again, we felt that aggrieved families deserve answers. So does the public and members in the law enforcement community. They all deserve a full and complete investigation of the facts that led to any tragic death, which of course is tragic. So Mr. Chair and Council, in sum, we believe that these common sense reforms to the Charter to create additional transparency and accountability and trust in law enforcement are necessary. And now the time for action and accountability is more is more clear than ever, in my view, and we must move forward together to get to the truth. And I'd, I'd finally like to make it clear that this was one of the early action items that uh, Chair Miller identified earlier that we moved forward last summer um, because it was adopted unanimously. Uh, we thought it was less controversial. And, and, and so we felt strongly about it then, and given current events, we, we feel well, I personally feel even, even more strongly about it. So, Mr. Chair, that concludes my overview of the inquest proposals. At this time, I welcome any questions or comments that you all may have. Thank you very much. Colleagues, questions? I'm seeing no questions. Council Member Zahalai. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to first thank um, Rob Saka. Uh, 
thank you for first of all for making me blush i appreciate you um i got to know rob when i was a associate at perkins cooey and he's always been an exceptional attorney and tireless champion for justice uh, i want to thank him alejandro trace uh, nikita oliver chair miller and everybody on the charter commission uh, charter review commission for all the hard work that you all have done um, I'm very supportive of this amendment. You know, families that have gone through the inquest process are families who we owe the most to. These are families who've lost loved ones at the hands of the government. And this charter amendment would make sure that if one of our constituents has had to suffer the death of a loved one, um, that they would be provided an attorney to go through the inquest or investigation process. So it's the absolute minimum that can be done, in my opinion, to uh, provide the fundamental right to representation during what is the most unimaginable con uh, situation that a family could could go through. Um, so I ask for everyone's support on this, and and thank you also to to the co-sponsors uh, on this legislation. Councilmember, um, done. Councilmember Dunn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I'm a little unclear. I, I, I got all the good arguments and they're good arguments in favor of the legislation. I didn't get sort of a, a real breakdown with specificity of the of the language. Is this are we passing an ordinance here or is this a charter amendment? I miss I, I guess I'm missing exactly what this details in terms of the inquest language. This is a charter amendment. As recommended by the Charter Commission. Okay, so l let me ask this question. What I heard was was a very good explanation of the arguments in favor of the Charter Amendment. I didn't hear a central staff breakdown. Are we not going to do that? We're just going to rely on the Charter Review Commissioners to provide the briefing. And, and that's fine, but I think there needs to be a little more analysis in terms of, of, of what it does, what the language does, and and, and sort of pro and con. Ms. Um, Mr. Senka's presentation as a commissioner was preceded by a staff report by Jenny John Batista. And if you have okay, that, questions of um, that, Ms. John Batista or, or want further information, we can certainly facilitate that. Yeah, I may. Jenny, can you just break this down? The the, the, the quick parameters, and I might have missed that. I was out of service for just a little bit. Um, sure. Can you Counsel break down the parameters sure. of what the inquest uh, language changes? Yes. So on page 406 and 407 of the packet, it's uh, just a sentence that we're talking, two sentences. Uh, the existing language is, is very short, and the changes are also very short, but they are substantive. So I'll go over it again. Um, if adopted by voters, uh, these changes to section uh, 895 of the tar charter would add the additional language regarding when an inquest is to be conducted. This additional language specifies, and so this is the following is new language, an inquest shall be held where a member of any law enforcement agency's actions decisions or possible failure to offer the appropriate care may have contributed to an individual's death. Additionally, there's another sentence added, for the purposes of this section, members of any law enforcement agency includes a commissioned officer, non-commissioned staff and agent of any local or state police force, jail, detention facility or corrections agency. The next substantive ad is, is again, uh, one sentence, but very substantive. The county shall assign an attorney to represent the family of the decedent in the inquest proceeding, but the family has the option of accepting the attorney or not. Uh, as Mr. Saka indicated, currently the current code uh, provides that de the Department of Public Defense shall provide an attorney to represent a family. So this would not change the county's, uh, the current practice now, uh, but it would elevate that to the charter. Additionally, as I noted earlier, the added language is intended to expand 
and broaden the number of inquests uh, that occur uh, with that additional language. Got it. Is there any kind of that? Okay, that 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 helps me a ton. Thank you for that, Jen. And I missed part of that. Uh, the, is there been a fiscal note or anything in terms of the costs associated? We think with that those additional changes. Uh, there has not been a fiscal note um, currently. The uh, county does fund uh, the administration of the inquest process. Uh, but there has not been a fiscal note to, to specify how many, uh, what the additional cost, if any, would be. Okay, thanks, Jenny. And Mr. Chair, real quick on this, we got 11 charter amendments. So the plan will be a central staffer will introduce the issue. Then we'll have a charter review uh, commissioner uh, make the pitch, essentially, is the plan, just so I understand. That's how we've done it today. If, if there are addition, if when we take up additional charter amendments, and to date, only five of the 11 have been introduced. Um, there are commissioners who wish to make presentations. The commission supplies somebody, then yes, we would follow a very similar format. Okay, thank you. Okay. Council Member Von Reichbauer. Sure, that was the uh, question. Council Member Dunn's question was the one I was curious about. If there was a fiscal note, if there was a limit on how much we pay, and I want hope that we'd have an opportunity to um, evaluate that and, uh, and, and the uh, full cut. Thank you, Council Member Lambert. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with Council Member Gramai that there couldn't be a more horrendous experience in life for anybody than to lose a loved one. Um, I did support the inquest process and paying for the attorneys, but the reason for a charter for me, is how the government works, not to pick special laws that we like and stick it in charters so it can't be changed for 10 years. So the things that are important here are already in law. We're providing the attorneys and we have inquests. And so I think that as a policy, taking our favorite pieces of legislation and sticking it in the charter that's not what the charter's for. And I have some concerns about some of the language, like possible failure, appropriate care, who, who decides what was appropriate care. And that's the reason we have laws so that we can define what is possible failure, what is appropriate care. So we have a definition. When you put it in the charter, we don't have that. These are already existing in, in the existing law. And I think that they are important. I can't imagine them being changed. So having them clearly defined in law is in my mind where these things should be not in charter. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Further discussion, colleagues? Council Member Balducci. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a brief uh, comment. I really appreciate the what appears to be some uh, serious care that went into drafting the language around when an inquest will be required. Um, I'm glad to see that this came out of the executive's process because I think as we all know, currently um, the executive or prior to his executive orders of recent uh, times would have a decision. Yes, this one gets an inquest. No, that one doesn't get an inquest. And that can, and that in and of itself can be, I imagine a very difficult decision to make, but also seem very odd and unfair to the people who have been infected by uh, the, the person who's been, you know, their family member's death. Like why is one, uh, one death worthy of this kind of deep public inquiry and another one isn't? So I think the standardization of it is really good, but also um, the, the, the Department of Justice has standards for when we report what, it, what an in-custody death is that counts for purpose of data collection and it sometimes doesn't make a whole lot of sense, I'll tell you. Like, so we have had people who have never ever set foot in our jail, who died in custody and were counted as a death inside the King County jails. We have likewise had people who have come into jail, had bad things happen to them in jail, 
got sent to the hospital because of the injuries they incurred, died at the hospital from their injuries and don't count as an in custody death, which is just crazy, right? So I like, when I read this, it to me, it makes a lot of sense that the way it's been stated, and I appreciate the, the work that apparently went into that, and I'm happy to support both the standard that's being set here for routine inquests be happening whenever uh, there is a death in our custody, uh, whether that be in police custody or in uh, or in like sheriff's custody or in our jails. And I really, I, I mean, I don't, I'm very happy to support the, uh, the proposal that the family gets uh, a support person who understands this difficult process, which I think would be hard for a lay person to navigate at the best of times. It all makes good sense to me and I, I support it. Thank you. Further questions? Councilmember Cole Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just to uh, chime in, I also support this. I was pleased to work on this issue in Law and Justice Committee when it came through uh, earlier. And uh, I think it's an important step forward. Thank you. Councilmember Zahalai is prime sponsor. I'd like to move the amendment, uh, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Zahala has moved adoption of um, Ordinance 119-236 and moved adoption of Amendment 1. There are two amendments, correct? That's correct. Say? There are two amendments and a title amendment uh, to conform with the First Amendment. Can you remind us um, the contents of Amendment 1 and Amendment 2? Yes, uh, they are both non-substantive amendments. Amendment one is uh, simply to make the same uh, changes uh, to the election date language. Uh, and then amendment two is intended uh, for style and readability changes so that the sentence reads a little bit better. Council member Zahala has moved adoption, move that we give a due pass recommendation to ordinance 2019-236 and adoption of Amendment 1, the date change. Discussion on Amendment 1, seeing none. All those in favor of Amendment 1, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The, the ayes have it. Amendment 1 is adopted. Councilmember Zahalai, Amendment 2? So moved, Mr. Chair. Councilmember Zahalai has moved to adoption of Amendment 2. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of Amendment 2, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it. Amendment 2 is adopted. Um, Councilmember Zahalai, would you move it? adoption of Title Amendment T1, please? So moved, Mr. Chair. Title Amendment T1 is before us. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of Title Amendment T1, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Title Amendment T1 is adopted. We have Ordinance 2019-236 as amended before us. Discussion. Councilmember Zahalai, would you like to open? Sorry. Um, I think we have said everything that needs to be said at this point. I hope uh, everybody supports this amendment and I'm very thankful for all those who worked on it and co-sponsored it. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Council Member Cole Wells. Sorry, Mr. Chair, I just left the uh, unmute button on. It's my little trick to see. Um, <laughs> I, think my, I think it's my advanced warning if I realize somebody's mute is off. I see people muting all over the place right now. Seeing no further, no one further to speak, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Balducci. Aye. Council Member Balducci votes aye. Council Member Dembowski. Aye. Council Member Dembowski votes aye. Council Member Dunn. No. Council Member Dunn votes no. Council Member Cole Wells. Aye. Council Member Cole Wells votes aye. Council Member Lambert. No. Council Member Lambert votes no. Council Member Uptegrove. Aye. Council Member Uptegrove votes aye. Council Member Von Reichbauer. Nay. 
Council Member Von Reichbauer votes no. Council Member Zahalai. Aye. Council Member Zahalai votes yes. Mr. Chair. Aye. Mr. Chair, the vote is six ayes. Council Members Lambert, Von Reichbauer, and Dunn vote no. By your vote, we have given a due pass recommendation to Ordinance 2019-236. Um, and we will advance that to full council. Um, we will expedite it so it would appear on next Tuesday's council agenda. Um, that takes us to the next item on our agenda, proposed motion 2020-208, calling for the executive to allow restaurants and retail businesses in unincorporated King County to have flexibility to provide more outdoor service. Mary Bruggenon um, will give the staff report. Ms. Bruggenon, the line is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, Mary Bergenon from the council staff and the materials for this item begin on page 433 of your packet. As you noted, proposed motion 2020-0208 would ask the executive to allow restaurants and retail services in unincorporated King County flexibility to provide outdoor dining or retail services in addition to what is allowed indoors during the phased reopening plan. As you all know, King County is right now in modified phase one of the Safe Start reopening plan and has applied to move into phase two, which could be permitted as early as the end of this week. Both of those phases impose fairly significant limitations on the kinds of activities that can happen indoors. And you'll see on page 435 of the packet, there's a chart that lists the types of activities that are allowed in modified phase one. And I'll call out in particular that for restaurants, uh, Indoor seating is allowed at 25% capacity in modified phase one, 50% in phase two. For retail operations, 15% uh, indoor capacity in modified phase one, 30% in phase two. For both of those types of services, outdoor activities are more expansive, uh, basically because the risk of transmission is lower outdoors. And so for restaurants in both phases, outdoor seating is allowed at 50% of existing capacity with new or additional seating allowed if it can be spaced so that there's six feet of distance between tables. Uh, and then for retail activities, again, there would be additional activities allowed outdoors as long as there is appropriate distancing. So what this motion would do is ask the executive that for restaurants and retail services in unincorporated King County, that they be given flexibility to expand um, outdoor activities in privately owned areas such as parking areas or other private uh, property, as well as adjacent sidewalks, alleys, or other right-of-way, ensuring that steps are taken to in assure adequate pedestrian pathways and that there be no additional permits or fees required. So the proposed motion would ask the executive to look into this, to prepare any legislation needed, and to implement this request with the provision that at the time that the county enters phase four of the Safe Start Plan, which would essentially be the back to normal activity that these provisions would sunset. That concludes my report at this point. I know that we've got executive staff here if there are any questions and I'm happy to um, answer any questions as well. Thank you. Questions? Up the Grove? Council Member up the Grove. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I assume, Mary, that this has flexibility given that it's a motion to the executive um, to somehow account for any potential conflicts should one person's right to, you know, new ability to set up tables impact uh, other people's something other than I think traffic flow was the only thing, but I'm if it reduces the number of parking spaces or creates noise for a business next door, I mean, is there, I don't think it'll be a problem, but I assume we don't get in that level of detail here that we just ask the executive to come up with a way to 
do this? Yes, that's correct, Council Member. This motion would just ask the executive to implement the appropriate regulations and again to do them in a way that doesn't require additional permits or fees during the safe start reopening period. Executive staff have noted that there would be essentially additional complications for businesses expanding into the right of way that would have to do with access and, um, you know, to maintain appropriate ADA access, for instance. And so all of those would, of course, have to be looked into as part of the permitting process. And, and this motion would ask the executive to take those steps. Okay. Thanks. Any further questions? Alducci. Councilmember Balducci. I think this is a great idea. Thank you to the sponsor and the co-sponsor. And I just wanna ask, is it something that's written in a way that we could update the code so that there are opportunities to allow this sort of activity, even when we are beyond like COVID, when just, just because it's a good thing to do? Uh, I would love to see that <laughs> as well. I wouldn't say no because it wasn't in there, but it would be great if it was something that was permissive uh, where you could see more outdoor eating and encourage more outdoor activity this way uh, into the future. Thank you, council member. The motion as written would sunset these temporary, um, more expansive opportunities at the time that the county enters phase four. However, it does ask the executive to prepare any needed legislation to implement them. And so it would certainly be something that were there to be additional legislation, the council could choose to keep it in force or to evaluate it at such time as we get back to normal life. Thank you. Thank you for that question, council member Belducci. Further questions to preference to those who open complimenting the um, sponsors of the motion. Council member Dombowski. I do want to compliment the sponsors and uh, let it be known that I will accept any invitation for alfresco dining from any of my colleagues in their districts pursuant to this legislation. And I'll buy the first round. <laughs> Very good. With that, I see no more questions. Um, this was an idea that I started to work on and I was um, obviously not thinking as big as Council Member Lambert, who always thinks very big because I was only thinking restaurants. It was her idea to make sure we were including retail as well. Council Member Lambert for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's a pleasure working with you. I'd like to make a um, motion that we um, that we pass ordinance 2020-0208 with a due pass recommendation. Councilmember Lambert has moved that we um, give a due pass recommendation to motion 2020-208 um, discussion. Councilmember Lambert. Thank you. Well, um, to the two speakers back, uh, Councilmember um, Alducci, I will enjoy eating with you outdoors and the previous speaker and the next speaker after that. Um, we will look for how many rounds, um, but this is important. Um, I would like to thank the city of Spokane they had the legislation and had put together quite a extensive um, book on what their thinking process were. And so we were able to get a lot of good information that might be helpful um, in going forward if you choose to do this um, after we get to phase four. And this will help our businesses that are having a huge struggle being sustainable to have more options of being able to keep their businesses. So I look forward to more evenings out and having a nice dinner or shopping. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Further discussion? Seeing none, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Balducci? It's a great idea, aye. Council Member Balducci votes aye. Council Member Dembowski? It's a fabulous idea, aye. Council Member Dembowski votes aye. Council Member Dunn? We aye. Council Member Dunn votes aye. Council Member Cole Wells? Ditto, aye. Council Member Cole Wells votes aye. Council Member Lambert? Council Member Lambert? Aye. Council Member Lambert votes aye. Member up the Grove? I guess, aye. <laughs> Council Member Up the Grove votes aye. Council Member Von Reichbauer? Cheers, aye. 
Council Member Von Reichbauer votes aye. Council Member Zahalai? Aye. Council Member Zahalai votes aye. Mr. Chair? Fantastic sponsors, I vote aye. The vote is nine ayes, zero noes. Thank you. By your vote, we have given a unanimous due pass recommendation to motion 2020-208, and we will expedite that post haste and full council. Um, Madam Council Chair, I urge you to have a meeting next Tuesday so we might take this legislation up. And with that, we move to item 11 on today's agenda, motion 2020-192. Um, this calls for the county treasurer to provide for payment agreements for 2020 property taxpayers. Wendy Suhu will give our staff report. Ms. Suhu, the line is yours. Thank you, Wendy Suhu Council staff. I'm really hoping the sponsor of this legislation can actually see my video because I feel like he would appreciate it. Uh, so the materials for this item begin on page 453, but I'm going to actually move you to the analysis section that starts on page 454 of your packet. Proposed motion 2020-0192 would request the county treasurer to provide for monthly payment agreements for 2020 and 2021 for taxpayers affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Under state law, however, the treasurer can only provide for payment agreements once account become once a, once a tax account becomes delinquent. And so payment agreements can't actually be offered prospectively. The Treasury section does have a property tax payment agreement program in place for taxpayers who are delinquent on prior year taxes. Uh, there was a change in state law earlier this year that would allow the Treasury to expand the program to taxpayers who are delinquent on current year taxes. And so that means that uh, as of this change in state law this year, people who did not make their payment um, as of June 2nd, uh, they would now be eligible to enter into payment agreements. Uh, turning to page 455, the amendment section, um, at the direction of the sponsor, uh, council staff has drafted a striking amendment S1 that would request the treasurer to identify those accounts delinquent on 2020 taxes as of June 2nd, 2020. Uh, the executive would also be asked to perform outreach to promote the delinquent tax payment program and also to look at uh, considering waiving or subsidizing fees charged by the third party vendor uh, that treasury uses to administer the payment agreement program. Uh, then finally, the motion also requests the treasurer to report on utilization of the program by April 1st, 2021. Uh, the striking amendment is on page 13 of the amendment packet, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. And Ken Guy and Carol Basil are, are here as well. Ms. Suhu, does the um, legislation, re is the county able to do this without legislative action from the state legislature? Yes. We have, the, we have the authority we need to do this now. Yes, there was a state law change that allows for counties to offer payment programs for current year delinquent taxes. Further questions? Council member Dunn. Mr. Chair, move proposed uh, motion 2020-0192 to speak to it. Council Member Dunn has moved to adopt that we give a due pass um, recommendation to motion 2020-192. Council Member Dunn. Thank you. And Wendy, I wish I could see you. I tried like crazy to do that, but I'm <laughs> uh, I'm a I'm a low tech man in a high tech world, so I was just barely able to hang on to the speakerphone. But I appreciate your patience. Um, <laughs> I want to thank my colleagues who. Uh, worked uh, with me on this plan uh, to provide property tax assistance to King County residents who in a number of cases, many cases desperately need it. Over the past few weeks, we've worked uh, really hard with the executive's office and the treasurer to integrate a lot of their valuable input into the striker that is before you today. We are um, painfully aware of the financial strains caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we, we share the common goals of getting help to those who are most affected uh, by our present crisis. This year, and this is important to note, this year, 28% more King County residents are delinquent on their property taxes compared to 2019. That's an additional 10,000 people who were not able to pay their property tax bill. And what today's striker does is focus on those taxpayers who are currently delinquent 
uh, June 1 being the deadline, and affords more flexibility to the county treasurer in implementing a, a proposed payment program while maintaining the intent of the original motion. The amendment asks that the county treasurer take steps, affirmative steps, to engage those who are delinquent in the first half uh, property tax payments as of June 2nd and offer them a payment plan for their 2020 property taxes. Uh, however, it leaves up to the treasurer to determine the details of designing and implementing the payment plan. The amendment maintains the request that the county treasurer consider the feasibility of either waiving or if possible subsidizing third party vendor fees that accrue during um, that are accrued due to that payment plan. So basically payment plans are, are already authorized under state law. They're all they're also something we already do. The county does not promote uh, them or reach out uh, in, in an effective way. And Ken might want to speak to the details of that, but there are vendor fees uh, and other things that are involved. So I appreciate again, my colleagues willingness to work with me on these, uh, uh, providing some flexibility for uh, taxpayers during these challenging times. And I also think that putting a payment plan together actually will end up generating the county more revenue because it, instead of people just abandoning their taxes for six months or a year or until there's a lien, it gives them a decent payment plan option uh, that they might be able to pay to amortize this debt. And I uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Further, further discussion? Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Council Member Dunn, will you move adoption of S1? I'll move S1. Striking amendment S1 is before us. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor of S1, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. The ayes have it, S1 is adopted. Um, then um, seeing no further discussion, uh, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Balducci? Aye. Council Member Balducci votes aye. Council Member Dembowski? Aye. Council Member Dembowski votes aye. Council Member Dunn? Aye. Council Member Dunn votes aye. Council Member Cole Wells? Aye. Council Member Cole Wells votes aye. Council Member Lambert? Aye. Council Member Lambert votes aye. Council Member Uptegrove? Aye. Council Member Uptegrove votes aye. Council Member Von Reichbauer? Aye. Council Member Von Reichbauer votes aye. Council Member Zahalai? Aye. Council Member Zahalai votes aye. Mr. Chair. Aye. Mr. Chair, the vote is nine, nine, zero, no's. Thank you. By your vote, we have given a due pass recommendation to motion um, 2021-92, um, and we will expedite that to full council a week from today. Um, Madam Clerk, I believe we have um, no council members who missed any votes, so no need for reconsideration. Is that correct? Mr. Chair. All right. And members, I will remind you before we adjourn, I will remind you, we have an employment and administration committee meeting that will immediately follow this. So um, the fund is not over. Do not hang up. Do not depart. With that, the cow meeting is adjourned and you may not hang up despite what my script says. <laughs>